is in two parts. I've got uh, the NEMI program, which is what I called the, t the talk, and then the QRIDIP funded projects, which are our forward looking ones. Um, so under the NEMI umbrella, we had uh, a number of different programs. We've got 100 meter mag coverage and eMERGE as well. We did the Kenobi AGG trial. Uh, we've got our four um, a coming up MT survey, we're calling the CCA MT survey, and then um, a deep crustal seismic interpretation project, which Dominic was going to talk about, but now I'm going to talk about that too. Um, so if I step through those in a bit more detail, um, since about 2018, what we've been doing in Mount Isa is expanding our 100 metre mag coverage. So this is updating the um, MIM grids that were collected in the 90s and are probably a bit past their use by date. So we're going back and collecting modern uh, 100 metre airborne magnetic and radiometric data. And by the time you've collected uh, this many surveys, so five surveys across Mount Isa, it makes sense to make a merge of that and not only use the regional data that we've collected, but merge in some of the company data as well. So the idea is that this product, which is available through our data portal, um, will provide a new base level merge that people can use as a first pass. If you want more detail, you can go into the individual surveys, obviously, but this is a beautiful first pass product. So it's uh, magnetic, that's the one VD, so beautiful detailed magnetic data coverage and Personally, my favourite is actually the radiometrics. This is stunning radiometric data. If you zoom in, you can actually see uh, formation level stuff, ge like real geological structures in this data. So it's, it is beautiful. Um, and so that's, that's what we're doing in the mag space. So moving across to gravity, as Helen mentioned, everyone loves gravity more than anything, and they really would like us to do as much high resolution gravity as possible. Um, the only fly in the ointment here is most of Mount Isa, which has been our focus um, up until now, has already got either four kilometre or two kilometre data. So to make some sort of meaningful improvement on this resolution is actually quite difficult um, at a regional scale. Trying to uh, zoom into either one kilometre ground gravity or um, even higher resolution than that presents a, list, a logistical nightmare where it's no longer really possible to do it as a heliborne survey, so we've got to go ground assisted and uh, it becomes a huge access task, which we don't really have the staff to do. Um, so what we've done as a trial is an airborne gravity gradiometry survey um, because there's actually a way of deriving an equivalent gravity product out of that airborne gravity gradiometry survey. Um, so this is the trial that we did up in Kenobi. So uh, Cloncurry is just down here, so up north of Kenobi, uh, up north of Cloncurry. Um, it was 4,700 uh, 4, line kilometres at about one kilometre station uh, line spacing, and it was flown late last year and released uh, earlier this year. Um, so this is the regional gravity in the background here. Through You can see through the lines, and this is the resulting survey. So you can see there's not, not a huge amount of increase in detail that we've got here, and that could potentially be a limitation of the geology in this area. There is enough of an increase in resolution here that we're willing to test it somewhere else, and some of the other surveys that we've seen in other parts of Australia really provide a bit more encouragement than we're getting in the Kenobi survey. So we will be continuing to trial this technique as a way of updating our gravity coverage. Uh, in the magnetic space, we kind of operate in both the acquisition and the modelling space because we realise that there's not a lot of uh, MT modelling capability available to explore. So we, we work in both spaces. Um, this is the coverage that we have to date. So all of these black sites are MT sites across Queensland, you can see they're primarily focused um, as large profiles along deep crustal seismic lines and then a couple of high resolution uh, arrays within that area. And a, a massive focus for me this year has been modelling the Cloncurry data set uh, in the orange box there. So this is, this is what that array looks like. It's almost a thousand sites that sit um, again, just to the north of Cloncurry, sitting down here at the bottom. This is the depth to basement, so you can see it's really in very explorable terrain. And we've got the 
uh, Ernest Henry Iron Oxide Copper Gold deposit in there as well. So it's quite a prospective area, obviously. I'm preaching to the converted. Um, so uh, that's been a modelling focus for us. And these are, I, I have written a report, it's with our publishing team who are working on it furiously, trying to get it done before the end of the year. I did put a lot of pictures in, so it's kind of my fault that it's taking a while. Um, so this is really the prime results of this uh, inversion modelling task. Um, this section of the survey down here in the southeast corner was already modelled with some colleagues down at Geoscience Australia. And what we've done is we've incorporated that data and remodeled the entire array, uh, trying to understand what this big crustal conductor is. If we can see any more of these small isolated conductors uh, similar to the one under Ernest Henry uh, and what's going on along the Quamby fault, which is up uh, the western side of this array. So there's quite a lot of detail in here and as soon as I release the report, you'll be able to read through it in exhaustive detail, um, which I'm sure you're all going to take home over Christmas and do that with your families. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sure that's what will happen. Uh, <laughs> so following on from that, like, there is a really strong indication in that MT survey in Cloncurry that there's some interesting associations between the Gija suture or Gija structure, depending on who you ask, uh, which is a major crustal boundary running up and down the eastern side of Mount Isa. So some major associations between that and potentially uh, targetable MT anomalies for explorers. So we've expanded out our MT coverage with this survey here. So this one was supposed to start before the wet season, but the wet season snuck up on me, so it's starting after the wet season. Um, it'll be about 10 kilometre station spacing. And really the aim of this one is to build a framework down the eastern side of Mount Isa uh, to try and target better infill surveys because we don't quite know where to go in at this resolution um, in the eastern part of Mount Isa with MT yet. Uh, and then seismic. Um, so this is our full array of deep crustal seismic and it's been collected over the last, I don't know, 20 years or so. Um, a lot of it has been collected in concert with Geoscience Australia and some of it was actually entirely Geoscience Australia up in this part here. But um, this has been sitting around as a beautiful data set that's probably underutilised. So this year and last year we undertook a couple of projects to try and build a cohesive interpretation of this deep crustal seismic network. Um, and that's There's a report already released on stage one of that which um, provides... Uh, a new interpretation uh, consistent across the full array of seismic lines modelled against the gravity and then compared to the MT models that we have available to us as well, trying to reinterpret um, oh, that, uh, these large-scale lower crustal blocks and the major structures that bound them so we can get some understanding of the evolution of the province but also where structures of interest might be in the seismic. So. Uh, this report was released earlier this year, maybe late last year, and then there'll be another one forthcoming um, early in the new year with uh, expanding this interpretation up onto the Lawn Hill platform and then a little bit into the territory. Uh, not too much, though, because I'm not allowed to work over there. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's that's kind of a roundup of what we've been doing this year. And then for our forward-looking program, I thought I would uh, give you a little bit of understanding of how we think about planning our... Uh, geophysical surveys. So as Helen mentioned, uh, we have a, uh, a new package of money for QRIDIP, which is $10 million over the next two years. And there is a large array of different kinds of geophysical data acquisition planned as part of that. So we'll look at an AGG survey or a couple of AGG surveys, depending on budget. Um, we're looking at expanding our regional AAM coverage, uh, continuing thinking about where we can value add with 100 metre mag red data. Uh, I, I am excited to know that we're going to actually undertake some deep crustal seismic um, acquisition as well to expand that network of seismic lines out to cover some areas that we don't currently have coverage and then uh, wade into the space of petrophysics as well. So um, Roger has, Roger Cant, who's in the room, um, We'll be heading up the petrophysics one in particular. I wanted to mention that because we're doing a trial next year of the CSIRO Mobile Petrophysics Laboratory, which I'm super excited about. Um, 
and then we'll be involved with Geoscience Australia on a lot of these projects, but particularly on um, projects that they're taking the lead on. So that's the OzLamp and the OzAEM. Um, but so this map is actually our current airborne MAGRAD coverage. So this is the sort of information we're feeding into planning. So I've coloured it up by the resolution of the survey. You can see there's huge amounts of Queensland covered in the yellow, which is 400 metre MAG. But then as we go into our focus areas, so that's uh, Mount Isa, and uh, up, up into the northeast, you can see there's already quite a large amount of high quality data here. So trying to understand where we plan these surveys to take advantage of areas that are a bit poor, uh, more poorly imaged and um, cry out for a bit more resolution while still understanding the limitations of our techniques. So we can't take 100 metre mag into 200 metres of cover and expect it to do a good job. It has to be outcrop or near outcrop for reasons of geophysics. Um, uh, so that's that's the mag picture that we have. This is the EM uh, AEM coverage. So we've got all of these surveys um, that sit through Mount Isa. So it's a huge amount of coverage already. And then there's a patchwork of little uh, surveys that sit out in um, northeast Queensland. And then there's this backbone of um, widely spaced AEM uh, from the Geoscience Australia AUSAEM project. So again, using this sort of input to try and plan our surveys. And then the final one I'll show you as a current coverage map that we'll be thinking about. So this is our deep crustal seismic in the uh, yellow lines. And then the grid of data in the background is the gravity image. So showing where we've got gravity coverage. Well, showing our regional gravity image, I should say. Uh, and then the big squares are the Oz lamp sites. So that's the broad scale um, crustal conductivity data that Geoscience Australia has been leading the acquisition of. So what we're going to do is try and expand up into this area in the north for deep crustal seismic to try and connect up some of these lines and give us a better understanding of what's going on with the big crustal architecture of the north of Mount Isa, and then expand this Oz lamp coverage um, out uh, across the bottom of the province in here, um, in the south of Mount Isa, and then wherever we can opportunistically as we get clearances. So this is an ongoing program that we'll be involved with over a number of years. Timelines are very ambitious. Uh, we're hoping to tender and acquire um, AGG, AEM, MAGRAD, and Petrophysics next calendar year. That seems entirely possible, uh, and do the seismic a bit later because that's harder, uh, basically. We don't have locked-in timeframes. We're always open to talking to people about where they think geophysics coverage should be or what you'd really like to see. So if you want that, come and talk to myself or Matt or Roger or, you know, Helen, whoever you like. Come and talk to us if you've got ideas about what we should be up to. That's it. Good. One down, one to go. Um, any questions for Janelle from the room? Uh, any online? I don't think there are. Sweet. I'll let you just grab a glass of water if you want before you can uh, fire up the next one. Yeah, I've just got to dust off all the geology knowledge in the back of my brain and try that one on here. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so Janelle will now be talking uh, about 3D seismic interpretation of the Northwest. When you're ready, Janelle. I promise I was just waiting for it to, I wasn't staring blankly into space panicking. Um, so this, <laughs> this is a talk by Dominic um, and he was very kind and wrote down all of the notes in this talk. So I will be going through that um, as well as I can. Uh, this is some work that myself and Dominic have been doing with Karen Connors, who was formerly with SMI, to try and uplift our level of geological understanding and provide uh a cohesive interpretation of our deep crustal seismic in Queensland. Um, so this is actually, this is what it looks like out in the Camerwell Seismic Survey, which was collected in 2019. Um, Onshore crustal seismic transects utilise a large array of geophones and long record times, typically up to 20 seconds, and allow us to investigate entire crust of the continent. Uh, modern surveys use the fibrous sized trucks like these guys in the picture, 
um, as the source, but some of the older ones use dynamite, and I wish I could go out on one of those older ones, but, you know. Uh, so what, why do we actually do these surveys? It seems like a, a more esoteric one than a lot of the other geophysics that we do. Um, well, because they're exciting, uh, because it can show us the big structures that are down in the earth. Uh, they can gain some understanding of geology and tectonics and mineral systems. But most importantly, for my mind, they give us a skeleton which we can hang small scale interpretations on. And so that's what we're trying to do here. Um, so there's a hell of a lot of seismic lines. If I step through them in the order they were collected, uh, it started with this guy here, which is collected in 94. Um, so it runs east-west through the guts of Mount Isa uh, across uh, just to the south of the Mount Isa deposit. Um, so that was in the early 90s. And then in 2006 to 2007, um, Geoscience Australia led quite a large project which we we're involved in, collecting even more seismic across Mount Isa and not across all of these transects. And then in 27, some really monster transects were collected up to Isa Georgetown and then through a Cairns as well. And so we're building quite an exciting network here. And then there's a huge hiatus from 2007 to 2014 when we got some uh, more money, new staff, and we decided to go again at these deep crustal seismic surveys. Um, we got these three lines here um, that were collected in 2014-15. And then there's another big push, um, this time led by Geoscience Australia, to investigate the South Nicholson Basin up here in the very far northwest. Um, and really those are to investigate the South Nicholson Basin and Proterozoic rocks in the Northern Territory by Geoscience Australia. And then um, the petroleum team, now, now defunct petroleum team, I don't know if I say that. Anyway, uh, that petroleum team were part of the group that um, collected um, a couple of smaller lines. So sitting in here, uh, really trying to understand some of the basin systems, this very extensive thick basins in this area. So if you add all that together, that's like 5,000 kilometres of seismic uh, and there's not really been a cohesive interpretation at a detailed level. So there's definitely been work done by people at Geoscience Australia, particularly um, Russell Korsh and Michael Dublier, uh, using these lines to interpret really big scale features. But we wanted to zoom in and do the next scale in. So that's what we've been up to with Karen. Um, so conceptually, for each generation, a new suite of science has been developed after the collection of these seismic lines. Uh, so there's some old interpretations here from uh, 1994 after the collection of the original seismic line. Uh, McCready and others generated a model that the, the older seismic is not as good a quality, so they've relied very heavily on, um, on the um, refraction seismic, that's the word I'm after, refraction seism seismic to try and interpret um, what's going on in the deep crust here? Because you can see there's not a lot of detail in this seismic section. Um, so that that's where we started in 2006, 2007, after the next spate of acquisition on seismic. Uh, those seismic sections were used to constrain some 3D models of the Imolai and the North Australian Craton at differing scales. And they kind of give you a taster of what we can accomplish with this data. So that's uh, this one down here. And then they were fed into the uh, Northwest Queensland Mineral and Energy Province model um, that was happening right when I started my career at the GSQ. So stepping through that, you can see as we collect more data, we get more sophisticated in our models. And so this one that we're doing now is trying to take that next step use all the data that we've collected recently to really push our understanding forward a bit. I love this analogy. I'm so glad he put this in. Um, so this is a swan. And if you reconstruct this swan, the way, we the way we reconstruct dinosaurs, it looks like this horror show down here. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? So uh, please keep in mind that my reconstructions are likely to be a swan. Reconstructed like this, uh, not not this. This is reality. So just deep breath. It's just an interpretation. <laughs> uh, so um, 
this, this project kind of came apart in two halves. We had Karen Connors doing some detailed uh, solar geology interpretation in the Eastern Succession of Mount Isa, and she's using predominantly potential fields data, but she's really drawing on the seismic to understand what the deep extent of the structures are that matter at the surface. So she's coming at it from a top, like a detail out to um, regional level uh, understanding to try and get some feel for what these these structures look like. And then at the same time, I was running uh, inversions on this MT survey, which is data around Boolea, trying to understand what the hell those mean uh, and using the seismic in a very coarse way to look for the big scale structures. Um, and really it became very apparent that our interpretations of these seismic lines were either insufficient or not done at all for reasons of staffing. So um, this project was put together and we all got together and tried to further um, the work. And then um, we also, during this time, have collected a lot of magnetotelluric data. So um, that has been further our understanding of Mount Isa in a different space. So um, we've got the OzLamp data giving us um, a conceptual understanding of the broad scale conductive anomalies in Mount Isa. Um, and then we've got uh, these high resolution grids as well that um, give us some detailed structure around Cloncurry. So how can we kind of put all of this information together and understand what's going on in a bit better detail? And then, um, yeah, so in 20, 20, 2021, we collected some data along these transects um, down here, and that was actually really important to our understanding of what's going on with these seismic lines. They really gave us another piece of information where we could tie the seismic and the resistivity together from the south of Mount Isa up to the north where we've got better understanding of what the geology is. Um, and they also, so that understanding also gives us something to put these uh, high, high resolution. So these are conductivity and resistivity shells from some of our more recent modeling. This one's up in Georgetown, um, looking at what, what the MT shows us about these big structures. Um, so you put all that together. That's, so that's kind of the why and the who and the how. Uh, and now <laughs> I'm now talking about the bulk structure of the inlier and two billion years of Earth history in an abridged format, which is a beautiful line. I love that line. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, in the middle uh, is the eyes of inlier. It extends under cover. There's a broad threefold division. Um, there's a central resistive keel that's imaged in the MT, and then on either flank, there's um, a conductive feature. So the eastern portion of the inlier is underlain by the concealed non numal seismic province with significantly more basement de uh, basin development interpreted to the east and superficial units and structures interacting with a mid-crustal detachment zone, which taps the mantle. The numal seismic province forms a distinct block from the Georgetown inlier flooring and into the intervening zone in central northern Queensland. To the west of Mount Isa, the province which abuts the ultra wire tenant and Murphy crustal elements, and to the south is truncated by the Thompson element. Um, so this one, this is the line in the south of Mount Isa that I pointed out. This is uh, CF3, and this is the complementary MT data that we collected last year. Um, so this model of CF3 is uh, it's, it's one of a series of three parallel lines. So there's essentially this one in the south. There's the M6 model, uh, the M6 seismic line that runs across the bottom extent of the outcropping Mount Isa province. And then the 94 line, which runs through the guts of it. And they all show very similar structures, despite spanning a few hundred kilometres. Um, one of the key... Whoop, uh, one of the key early findings is the identification of this really thick crustal block in here through the pitta pitta um, block. And it was, it's very obvious on the seismic if you look at it even without the interpretation lines on it, I promise. Um, but it causes a really big problem in your gravity model because you've got a depressed moho, which should reduce your gravity, but instead you've got this stonking great 
positive gravity anomaly that you have to account for. So there's really, um, in order to honor the reflective seismic and the big resistive block that's in the same spot, um, we had to put a very dense block in there as well, which is quite an unusual thing. Uh, so we've called this block the Pitta Pitta block. It's the basement to the Calcutin Leichhardt domain and marks a change in vergence from east to west dipping in the mid to lower crust throughout the Mount Isa province. Uh, so the eastern boundary, as we um, obviously move out to the east, the Gija structure is the dominant feature as we move to the east of the province. Um, it's in the mid crust in the eastern side of Mount Isa province and uh, the structure mounts, marks the boundary between the Mount Isa crust and the normal crust in the further east. So you've got the central Isa and Pitta Pitta blocks, a big dipping uh, suture zone. So this was interpreted by various, um, so it's interpreted in a couple of different publications. Uh, and then the, the normal block sits underneath that. Uh, so the original Gija Sutra was interpreted by um, Russell Korsh and others in 2012, and it um, localised the western depicenter of the Soldier's Cap Kuradoa Basin. Um, but after the deposition of those units, it actually represents a closure of a basin during the eyes of orogeny. So it's quite a complex um, structure that's had quite a complex history. Um, in it's uh, the granites of the Williams Super Suite and Maramundi Suites lie within the upper crust above this network of conductive zones. So we're talking about, um, so you can see in this interpretation, there's a series of um, granite bodies here interpreted above this conductive uh, network of fault zones through here. So that's what we're talking about. Um, so they lie in upper crust. Sorry, could you go down on the notes a little bit? Thank you. Um, and they have near dimmer model ages that indicate these granites were sourced from the normal crust rather than the Mount Isa crust. So this implies that the melts were formed within the lower crust below and to the east of the Gidja structure and ascended via the Gidja structure or through some of these other faults in the area. The conductive anomalies on M6, so this one at the bottom is M6, um, show a network of altered zones around moderately dipping faults that can be interpreted as the main fluid conduits, uh, the west dipping crustal structure that we call the Gija structure is the main zone and the east dipping crustal scale structures in the central Isa terrain branching off it. So that's the Gija structure here um, on this section and then these east dipping structures here. So you can see there's quite a good correlation between these um, large scale faults and the conductive anomalies that we've imaged with the MT. Uh, and then we can also use this interpretation. So this, we've zoomed up to Cloncurry. Um, so these are some high and low resistivity shells from the Cloncurry inversion work. Uh, the red ones are conductive, the blue ones are resistive. And we've got the Gidget structure here on the IG1 line. And you can see there's an association up across between its conductive features and then it uh, flattens out above, along this major crustal boundary here interpreted in the seismic. Um, and the, the resistive block seems to correlate very, very well with the Mount Isa sediments that are sitting on top. Uh, so if we look at uh, some... Um, so this, this is a map that shows the province and geological units symbolized by crustal separation ages. So as part of the study, there was some more um, isotopic data collected, but there's also a compilation of literature from mostly Dave Champion's work down at GA. So that uh, Dominic took that and he plotted it up for igneous and non-igneous um, analyses. And uh, overall, it shows a pattern of younging from west to east, uh, particularly in the igneous rocks, which is uh, the one on the left, I believe. Um, so you can see that in the east we've got younger source rocks, um, which supports the existence of the lower crust normal block, which is a younger age um, block. Um, there is a, a little bit of a fly in the ointment um, with the Maribo Stabley zone, and I 
don't know enough to explain that away. Um, but if you, I'm sure you can ask Dominic about that one. Uh, but so the the fact that this same pattern is reflected in the sedimentary analyses or non igneous analyses means that this uh, has been in place for a long time because it's sourcing this existing um, signature for the rocks that are being deposited afterwards. Uh, so that's what's going on in the east. Um, out to the west, uh, there's a transition from the really strongly north-south, um, the really strongly north-south oriented fabric of the Mount Isa block to um, a number of different uh, terrains in the lower crust that are very poorly exposed in Queensland. And it's complicated by the fact that our seismic coverage in this area is not perfectly um, designed to image these structures. So we've got uh, the Ultra, the Tennant and the Murphy South blocks and these red structures are their bounding structures and the blue ones are our seismic lines. So in some places we're imaging them quite well and in other places they stop just shy and we don't quite get a good understanding of what's going on. But um, despite that, um, the Ultra Tenon and Murphy South blocks were originally defined in plan view based on potential field data and an integration of the deep crustal seismic indicates that there's a good match with potential field interpretation, but it's resulted in the revision of some of the near surface locations and new insights into their extent in 3D and the complex nature of what's going on in this area. So this is from the new work that we haven't uh, got through publishing yet. I've actually still got to do some figures. So again, it's my fault, not publishing's fault. Um, so these sections, they don't exactly match. Anyone familiar with the deep crustal seismic lines, which is probably no one. Um, <laughs> um, this is the M4 line. So we're looking north to south on this section. Um, so M4 is obviously in the north. Uh, we go through the SN3 line, which is from the recent uh, Geoscience Australia program, and then onto the southernmost C2 line, which is from the GSQ program. Um, overall, the structure north to south is a bivergent two-layered tenant block in the middle, um, which is overlain by the Calvert and Isa super basins in the yellow and blue, and the bounding faults. Sorry, I didn't finish reading that. The bounding faults are controlling the variation in sedimentation. The south dipping crustal scale fault that juxtaposes the Murphy South and Tennant basement terrains is imaged on SN4 and M1, um, neither of which is shown here. Uh, but it's actually really nicely imaged across the border in the Northern Territory on SN1. So that would be the best one to look at if you wanted to see what it really looks like. And we, we did look at that in this process and it's informed our interpretation here. Um, uh, and actually... Uh, yeah, and, and the work that Geoscience Australia has been doing in the East Tenant area has also, it also is related to this um, Murphy South Tenant kind of um, interface here. So it's obviously something of great interest. Um, the seismic data indicates that the basement terrain underlying the Tenant Creek region extends eastward to form an east-west trending bivergent block overlaying the ultra wire to the south and the Murphy to the uh, north. And the tenant terrain underwent a complex evolution uh, during deposition of a hell of a lot of sediments uh, and metavolcanics uh, from 1870 to 1790. And then there's extension and magmatism and a lot of intermittent compressions. So That's a very complex area. However, the terrain is interpreted to have developed into a discrete crustal block as a result of extension technique tectonics. Our preferred model is that the pre-1870 tenant crust represents a low angle fault block rifted from the Murphy South terrain. Um, and really this shows the power of integrating all of this seismic together, trying to come up with some sort of cohesive interpretation. So if instead of looking at it north-south, we look at it east-west. So this is effectively two profiles, one in the north. So SM2 um, is in the north and so is M3. Uh, M3 is actually not, uh, is directly north of Mount Isa by, I don't know, 50, 100K, something like that. And then um, the C1 and 94 line obviously runs straight through Mount Isa. So 
this is what we're seeing in this is from the previous work this wildly exciting c1 line is from the new work as is um their sn2 work up there um so i don't know how many more i've got uh, <laughs> um so let me think how can i summarize this well before evan kicks me off the stage um so really um in these east-west sections, uh, we're seeing what we're seeing is um, the Murphy South and the Ultrawara basement blocks have been accreted onto the North Australian pattern prior to any involvement with Mount Isa, and then um, they've come into Mount Isa and crashed against the very dense core, the Pitta Pitta block that sits through the centre of the inlier, and then the central Isa block has been thrust up over both as part of that collision. Um, I don't know the timing of that, but it's led to, I think it's all, it all has to happen pre-accretion of the, at the future suture. So all of this happening in the West happened before what's going on in the East. Um, uh, and then if I touch very briefly, because the, the interpretation does go, um, beyond the Mount Isa province. So this is the mag data for all of Australia. You can see the stonking great, uh, discontinuity in the mag. Um, we image that in the seismic as well. There's quite a lot of, uh, discussion about that on the report that's already released. So I might let you read through that one yourselves. Uh, there's been quite a lot of outputs for this, um, been a number of conference presentations. There's a report that I keep referring to. Um, there's some 3D models that we've done uh, together with SMI. So I think maybe they're in Digital Earth. Maybe Steve will tell me I'm lying later. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, but what we're doing is we're trying to release a new report and then we're going to take this same kind of ethos in how we're interpreting deep cross seismic and transport it to a new project that we're doing up in the northeast with JCU. So continuing the same sort of work, but in a new, uh, in a more expanded area. And then I love this note of caution again with reconstructions. Uh, when they first found uh, the bits of Matabarasaurus, oh, is that what it is? Iguanodon fossils, Iguanodon fossils, they reconstructed this creature in it, these horrible lizard looking things. Uh, but actually it looks like this. So as we add more and more data, so they found more bits of skeleton, added more data, they got closer to something that's probably still a naked swan, I guess. Uh, but we're getting better. <laughs> we're getting better. So as we add more data to these interpretations, we can refine them better. I'm going to leave it there. Now I'd like to call up Stephen Micklethwaite, Associate Professor, University of Queensland, SMI, who will be talking about digital earth, a digital geoscience twin with potential for something much broader. Welcome, Steve. Thanks, Evan. And Janelle, you did a great job. I would have been terrified having to give someone else's talk at the last minute. And to answer your question, the 3D models are going in, but they're not there yet. Um, and that's what I'll partly mention. Um, uh, before I start, uh, I also want to give an acknowledgement of country. Um, I'm sitting on the Reconciliation Action Plan at UQ, um, which I'm really looking forward to digging into. And you know, we do, we do take seriously the fact that um, that uh, that the traditional owners have looked after and, and had custodianship over this land for tens of thousands of years, um, way before we Westerners arrived. And so we want to pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants and who continue the cultural and spiritual connections to country and will recognise their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. Um, digital twins. And I was so excited to hear Duncan talk this morning, actually just in terms of acknowledgement of country, about the digital work that he is doing um, with uh, First Nations peoples. And hopefully there will be some opportunities there to connect with him um, on this initiative. Um, the, the authors are there, the, the name of the title is mine, and uh, I haven't shared this with my co-authors, so you can blame me for the mistake. Sorry, Matt. Um, but before I go further, the idea of building a digital twin um, in Queensland is all about um, 
uh, putting together as much data as we possibly can from the mineral sector uh, at every scale, from nanoscale, microscopic scale, right up to that that regional geophysics you've just heard um, Janelle talk about. And, you know, that's a pretty big vision project. And in order to do that, it's needed some serious uh, um support from from decision makers and, and leaders in the sector and so i really have a massive list of of acknowledgements there and particularly rick valenta who began who, who initiated the idea and helen de and tony knight at the department of resources who who've really been pushing the agenda and i think queensland is the only state in the country that's taking this quite seriously and developing this now and that's partly because of the data modernization program that they that we've been going through um in our state it not moving forward there we go um so spent a few slides stating the problem um many of you who are in the sector will recognize these sorts of spatial portals um you know these are places we go to on the internet to to ob obtain data that is useful to our work program um and you have this data that there's portals from oscope from csiro from the different states from the federal survey um, in particular, the image on the top right is the GSQ Open Data Portal, which has really undergone a, a, an evolution in the last few years, again, due to the data modernization program. And we've already heard today a little bit about, um, you know, Helen touched on optical character recognition and the fact that all the legacy data that the states and the surveys, the federal surveys hold, um, is, is, is an issue in terms of getting that out there in a format that everyone can consume. And we've got new data coming in um, on a daily and weekly and monthly basis. And it's so it's continually being updated. It's many different formats. Uh, it's unconstrained. You know, the, the volumes of data can fluctuate wildly from, from one week to another. And the question is, is well, how the hell do we um, know what's out there? And how do we access it? How do we consume it? And how do we use it? Um, to really accelerate our workflows. And on top of that, um, the Mineral Deposit Atlas work of the last few years, um, which SMI has, has you know, been privileged to, to drive in, in Queensland, well, that's, that's resulted in, uh, I think, 21 chapters for the North West Minerals Province alone. Each of those chapters has a 3D a geoscience analyst project associated with it, multiple ArcGIS projects, QGIS, MapInfo, um, I think even LeapFrog, if I remember rightly, and similarly for the Northeast Queensland. So there's a lot of spatial information out there. And Rick realized when he was going through this that it's quite frustrating because you have some fantastic data on an individual deposit, but you can't look at Mount Isa deposit right next to Ernest Henry deposit, right next to Lord Lady Loretta, in the same software environment in one go. You have to unload the project and upload a new one, and then there's computer hardware issues and so on. So that's the problem statement. You know, with, with data modernization, with the digital age that we now have, we have lots of data, but it's in, and it's in inaccessible formats um, often. So how do we discover all that data? How do we know what's out there? How do we fully utilize it for decision making? And how do we avoid computer and software limitations? And particularly, how can we do this? You know, we heard from Helen that, and, and others that the majority of the sector in this state is, is the junior, is a small company end of the market. And a lot of those companies, you know, can't afford big teams and large, expensive proprietary software. So can we build a tool that's open access to everyone, which gives everyone equal opportunity for downloading, discovering, downloading, and doing decision making around the 3D and 2D spatial information that's out there? And that's where digital twins come in. Now, um, just a quick refresh. Definition, what is a digital twin? Um, well, it's a, it's a counterpart of a real world system. And in our case, we want to build a digital twin for the visualization of geoscience and mineral sector data and the discovery of it, and then ultimately the ability for you guys to download that really easily and, and do your own analysis on your own laptops. So this is not a replacement for LeapFrog or for Arc, ArcGIS or, um, or MapInfo or whatever. It's, it's, 
it's going to be a portal, a window, uh, a shop, if you like, to find the data so you can do your own work in your own time, in your own systems. And um, we're sort of feeling our way through this program. It, you know, it's began as a, a one-year proof of concept. It's now morphed into a three-year program uh, uh, as we've been able to demonstrate some successes. And the main um, uh, body of the work, uh, the, the main engine underlying it, is, is, has been built by a commercial partner called Euclidean. And Euclidean have a um, cloud environment where the, all the geoscience spatial information that's out there can get converted into a Euclidean format and then can get stored in the cloud. So we don't have to wor worry about hardware limitations for the storage of that data. And then there's some smarts around how you visualize that, how they visualize the data. And SMI and GSQ, we're working really closely with Euclidean to make a geoscience-friendly product. And in the first year uh, of the, well, I'll get on to that in a second. The other main partner for this year is 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 Esri Australia, and, and uh, so that's shown here in this this outline of the of the approach, if you like. So last year, 2021 to 2022. We basically built a proof of concept. We took the Euclidean engine, we threw in lots of data from the Northwest Minerals Atlas um, and uh, from Open Data Portal, uh, but not all of it, and we just showed what we could do. This year, starting 20 days ago, uh, we actually now are trying to build a tool that will go production level. So we're integrating into GRS Globe, which is um, the the Department of Resources spatial platform for where you can discover data in 2D. And we're basically building a an extra tab in GRS Globe, which will show you what data is available in 3D. Um, and uh, it will be for the Northwest Minerals Province initially. Um, but that is a really neat piece of work. It's going to be a curated, simplified version of the digital Earth model in the GRS Globe platform. And then the ultimate goal um, by the end of year three, by the end of 20, by financial end, financial year in 2024, um, there will be a production level standalone twin for the minerals uh, sector in Queensland. And hopefully that will contain all data for all of Queensland at every scale we can possibly get in there. Um, now, these are just sort of the work elements that we uh, have slowly developed to go through this this program and you know uh, janelle has just talked um on behalf of dom about actual interpretive work that we're doing so there was has been a program of seismic reinterpretation and modeling so that's new data new information that's going to be going in there and building a team of research assistants and students to, to work with gsq on the legacy data issue and how we get all this old data that's in weird formats in there and then I'm working with Euclidean and Esri, who are software development companies. So they have this approach to, to um, uh, projects, which is around agile development. And I'm learning the language of, of uh, software engineers in terms of sprints and stand-ups and showcases, which is a completely new world to me as a geoscientist. Uh, but it's actually really in interesting. It's very programmed, but it does have clear goals and milestones and means that you can be quite efficient in achieving uh, what you're after. And we're going to go through, you know, I'm hoping we'll be able to go through a, a, a process of some in-house workshops between SMI and GSQ, where we really put together the inventory of data that should be in there, and whether it's QAQC'd and, and you know, make sure all the hyperlinks work and then the data's in the right location, and then bring that back to you guys in external facing workshops so you can do some proper beta testing and tell us what we've missed. Right, so on the right here, there's a video playing as I speak, and that is real-time sign-in. And you can see it's going through a browser, and you're gonna you're gonna see um, that we uh, the the Euclidean UD Stream Digital Earth model will activate. And this is sort of just the the steps that I go through. So there's a list of some of the data that's on the on on the web page that is in Digital Earth, and we're gonna jump over to what's called scenes. There's a whole bunch of Mickey Mouse um, prototypes, and the one that we're actually interested in is Mount Isa Atlas model. 
Um, and you can launch this through a web browser or through a standalone application. We've, I'm launching it here through the standalone application. And you know we, what this video will do now is it will just work through the loading up of the data. And there's nearly, nearly 400 gigabytes of data in there at the moment, which is actually nowhere near the amount of data that's available for that region. So this is still very much proof of concept. And you can see the UD stream kind of software environment framework there. And the data's loading in. We've ordered it in the project panel on the left in terms of um, cadastral stuff, you know, regional geology information, regional geophysics information, uh, and so on. Um, while that's playing, uh, you'll see funny kind of Lego-like images falling from the sky, like coming from the moon and then landing on the earth, and then that's actually the data loading in. While it's playing, I'll just quickly describe, you know, what we did in the proof of concept work. And so there was an element there of automatic pipeline. This is not going to be a manual process. We want this to be able to automatically upload data from Open Data Portal without a human being have to having to intervene. So we've demonstrated that for drill call. Um, we've done a lot of data conversions and visualizations of different types of data. We've got drill core photos and hyperspectral scans and lithologies and assays in there. We've got a, a large range of different geophysical types, some of them just captured as images, some of them as the actual data itself, uh, including remote sensing stuff like LIDAR and, and photogrammetry. Uh, we have classic geology maps and cross sections, uh, 3D surfaces. And we've got cadastral information. So we've shown we can put in there shape files with, with roads and state boundaries and, and rail lines. And to be honest, a lot of this, a lot of the demonstration of the possibility of this was done by Rick Valenta, who's who's in the room. You know, I don't know where he found time, but over the weekend and working with his son, he would go away and then the next next week I'd discover there's a whole new data type in there. Um, now another aspect to this work has been web integration. So as I say, this is not meant to be a replacement for LeapFrog or for DataMine or anything. This is meant to um, be a tool that's going to give you easy, accelerated access to the data out there and can work in with all those other existing platforms. So we wanted to demonstrate that you could build this environment into an ESRI environment and you could integrate it into Cesium, which is just another type of 3D visualization platform. And we wanted to demonstrate that it could integrate into Jira's globe. And so we did that during the proof of concept um, work. And as a result of that, um, the Department of Resources have, have now decided to fund this year's program of work where we will actually try and complete that and bring it to production level, at least in a very simplified, simplified way. So I expect there will be some form of 3D digital twin available to all of you by June um, this year. What do you feel uh, the heat coming? Um, yeah. And oh, that's just to show a magnified view uh, showing that there is now loaded into into there nearly 400 mega gigabytes of, of data. So that took about three minutes. And then after you've all the data's uploaded, uh, you can zoom in and out from the microscopic scale to the regional scale almost seamlessly. You know, you can. We have actually got a uh, a core, an, an X-ray fluorescence scan of a core sample in there, which is showing you density in 3D. And uh, you can zoom into that, and then you can step back out and look at the regional seismic, and it doesn't fall over and it doesn't have to retile or anything, which I think is pretty cool. Um, for the sake of time, how am I doing for time? Two minutes. All right, we'll quickly skip on from there. Um, just quickly, in the proof of concept, there's been some bespoke tools. We build a legend, build the ability to you know visualize legends, simple query tools, uh, where you can look at things like drill core and and ask yourself, well, what lithologies have 50 ppm gold in, or 50 ppm gold and 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 0.1 percent copper. Um, you can obviously spatial capture just, you know, you can look at smaller areas of the whole data set and, and there's ways, ways of, of examining, stepping through different attributes in the data. And ultimately, we've demonstrated, but we haven't really implemented yet, the ability to click on an object and say, okay, I want that data. 
and, and it hyperlink you to open data portal and download it automatically. So we've shown that that's possible. And this next two years program of work is going to be making these tools um, robust and um, reliable. So this is the last slide and it is a demonstration even within 20 days of work of our very first piece of um, integration with GeoRes Globe. So I've jumped onto the GeoRes Globe website. I've activated GeoRes Globe and you'll see down in the bottom left hand corner there's in gray there's four very vague tabs. So this is how you know probably a lot of you are very familiar with GeoRes Globe in the room. This is a standard, the standard 2D view you get when you open that tool up. And we're just clicking now on the, the, the development tab for, for the Digital Earth. It's been authorized. You can ignore that page. That will disappear in a second. And suddenly we're, port, we're transported into the 3D world. And the data's loading in there. And all of a sudden we have in GeoRes Globe, when I eventually zoom in, uh, we have the seismic and the AEM data and the the regional surface geochemistry data shown in there. And you'll see that the seismic data, when we just rotate around, has got all the textures and colors of the interpretation that Karen Connors has been um, building with, with Janelle and, and, and Dom. So that's just because GeoRes Globe is, is, a, is an ArcGIS program, it it, there is a little bit of retiling in this in this format, but you can see that the resolution is really appearing there. So yeah, early stage results, very, very promising. This is not available yet in the public domain, uh, but um, it will be soon, hopefully. That final slide is just a, is just a list of where we're going in the future and um, groups like Euclidean are already very, proficient with with um, things like virtual reality and augmented reality uh, glasses. So, you know, we can take this beyond your standard tablet and your laptop. We can do collaborative work in a, in a, in a, um, a you know, a, what do you call it? Yeah, an augmented environment. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, do we have any questions for Steve from the room? None online that I can see. No? Cool. Thank you very much. Me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, right. please do. I'd like to welcome um, Nick Cook up onto the stage now. Uh, we've heard briefly about the Deposit Atlas, uh, but Nick will be diving a little bit deeper. Nick's the group leader, Total, Total Deposit Knowledge, University of Queensland, Sustainable Minerals Institute. Welcome, Nick. Thank you. I'll start the alarm here so I don't go into afternoon tea time. Okay. I feel, uh, I suppose, privileged to be back in Queensland working, and uh, I'll, you'll notice that the authors are lifted, listed over on the left on this diagram, and I'm actually the presenter here, having just been at SMI for the last nine weeks. So I would like to uh, thank you very much to all the contributors for the previous editions of the Mineral Deposit Atlases. So I'm going to discuss where the Mineral Deposit Atlases have been over the last, uh, I suppose, three, three and a half years, and going to discuss right at the end where we're going in the next 20 of those and it's great to see the feedback that uh, you as exploration industry and as uh, academic researchers love what's being done. So let's hope that we can continue that trend over the next uh, couple of years. So first up, it's a cooperative project with Geological Survey of Queensland. We are now up to stage three of the mineral deposit atlases, having been started by Rick and then taken on with Rick and Mark Hinman. And, and then a succession of other people through the project. And I'd like to acknowledge Paul Gow, who's not able to be here today, who has essentially run the project for the last two years or so. So, oh, that's right, I've got it down here. So the Mineral Deposit Atlas, um, basically a reference document 
with a focus on documenting deposit characteristics, um, the halo and signature from an exploration perspective. And it's divided into two parts. There is a simple or relatively simple, depending on what deposit it is, uh, PDF document. And then there's a 3D atlas. So you can actually go in and play with the, the data in three dimensions. And the data are compiled in Geoscience Analyst. So uh, it's a free platform for viewing. Uh, but there also are raw data there, so you can import them into your platform of preference. So it started with the Northwest Mineral Deposits Atlas. And I think there's 21 chapters of that. And there's 28 deposits in that were included overall. And those were discovered, as you know, between 1882 and 2006. And we cover a reasonable range of metals, copper, copper, gold, lead, zinc, silver, molybdenum, and rhenium, gold, uranium, and phosphate in that deposit atlas. And we all know how truly, truly wonderful the Northwest Mineral Deposit is. Um, so the data sources that we use to compile the atlases come from various sources. And I would like to acknowledge the contributions made by companies who don't have to give us uh, proprietary data or data that is not yet in, yet in the public domain. We really appreciate that cooperation. And uh, here's to the 20 of you that we'll be contacting next, asking for more of that. So lots of drill databases in here, three-dimensional geologic models, there's historic research theses, public material, and government databases uh, included in the system. And there's a bunch of regional data sets that are used. And we use the regional data sets across different scales, right from Queensland wide as part of this project, right down to the prospect scale. <clears throat> And most of the regional databases for an individual project are around 40 by 25 kilometres. And we have high resolution presentation of the data sets. And as you heard before from Steve in the digital world, that some of these data will be included uh, into the digital atlas or digital twin as that starts to appear. There are lots and lots of photos. So I'm a you know, what you'd call a meat and potatoes geologist. My hand lens and hammer are part of my favourite toolbox. And there are lots of photos of rocks. So we really start with a feeling that the rocks still relate to the great data sets that are included in here. We have deposit scale data, data sets. And the objectives are to try and get these ore bodies into a geological context. And not only that, we all know when we've actually hit an ore body, it's the halo, the alteration signature around it, the near hit, as our friends in Finland used to remind me, it wasn't a near miss, it was a near hit. Um, that is equally important because we don't want to walk away having missed something that is, I suppose, held in the data set that we actually uh, can't see or have missed because we don't understand the alteration signatures around these deposits. Lots of basic data we grab and also specialised data, especially as that's starting to come online in a bigger way. High logger, TEMA, petrophysical data, and lots and lots of thesis data from uh, different universities around Queensland and further afield around Australia. So the typical data sets that we look at, and here's some of them from the Northwest Province for a start. And just to show you some beautiful rocks on the right hand side, soil geochemistry, we will take things like the original data lines that led to the discovery. And uh, you'll know Century now, it's actually being looked at for reprocessing, but photos of the ore, interpretations of the ore at different scales and the data itself. We have stream sediment data including, say, in the example of Tick Hill here, the, the original data recorded by Peter Forrestal here for the discovery of Tick Hill. So we try and capture the thinking of the geologist at the time 
that actually made the discovery because seeing inside their heads as to how they worked is important in this process always. Lots and lots of aeromagnetic data. You all know this fantastic aeromagnetic data over Queensland, and we use that repeatedly in nearly all of our data sets in various interpretations. And zooming in to a couple of them here, an example of part of the Cannington uh, Atlas entries, and with including Moronin, and you'll see again more rock information uh, in terms of cut slabs, interpretations of structural geology and uh, mineralisation. In places we will go down to EM data. So here um, for Walford Creek, the 100 millisiemens per metre conductivity isosurface there plotted as part of the, the model along with geological sections incorporated in 3D. And so these are taken, that section on the lower left, for example, is taken out of the um, geoscience analyst 3D view. But we also add in where we can atypical exploration data sets. And that might include oxygen isotope data, but we're trying to relate it to more traditional things here on the left. So we have, not sure my slides are updated. Um, we have, go, how do we go back? So we have uh, lead, zinc and copper, uh, RAB and DDH data on the left and oxygen isotope data on the right and along with the three-dimensional uh, picture of the copper system in ISA in the centre there. So we're always trying to relate this 3D imagery into the picture. And if you come along tomorrow, for example, to the core display, you will actually see the integration of the deposit data sets into uh, drill core. At Cannington, for example, we were fortunate enough to get uh, high spec data so that mineralogical logging down hole can be used in conjunction with the photographs. And there's the interpretation color set down the bottom. But we're again, we're trying to locate the holes with respect to the ore deposit in every case so that you get a feeling for where you are with respect to, in this case, lead zinc silver data and the mineralization. Tema data, so another version of the microscopic automated identification of minerals here from one hole at Osborne to look at the distribution between pyrite, pyrotite and chalcopyrite, I believe, in the, on the right-hand image there. But again, photos of the drill core, location of the drill core, 3D ore body image with respect to the pit. And at Ernest Henry, uh, tomorrow you will see hole 550 if you're lucky enough to be out looking at rocks uh, across on the left-hand side there. And we've collected, or we, or the, we've incorporated Jim Austin's AMS data to look at the magnetic is anisotropy of this system. So we've tried to gain every data set that we can find to incorporate into the process. And to give you an idea, it takes about a month. So our general schedule is at about a month per uh, mineral deposit to do this. And we have a 20 month schedule ahead of us to produce the next round. And they do get released sequentially. In terms of the most recent um, atlases, the Northeast Queensland atlases, in co uh, I think there's 11 in total, three tungsten, a nickel scandium, five tin deposits, and two base metal deposits. 
uh, across the northeast, so Cairns down to almost Townsville. And this is the list of those uh, prospects. So the tungsten deposits listed here, so Mount Carbine, Watershed, Wolfram Camp. So I'll show you a couple of the images from the, from the atlas here, and uh, we'll then go on and discuss some of the regional data sets that go with it. So residual gravity images, um, aeromagnetics and geological summaries. So again, these are incorporated as layers into the geoscience analyst. But old resource data built with 3D imagery of the uh, ore surfaces and old mine data when we've got it. And again, old images, uh, new rocks, mineral descriptions, so that you can understand basically without going there, and especially if you're thinking about exploring in the region what these rocks actually look like. Magnetic data, and you can see the, the big ring horn fells up on the left-hand side associated with the granite, and the thorium, so the radiometric data on the right-hand side. And for the same image, we have stream sediment data incorporated in with the geology. In this case, this is tungsten on the left and tin on the right. In the Mount Carbine pit with the resources and reserves and the 3D model uh, taken from a geoscience analyst. And there's a movie here just giving you a demonstration of the so this is going to run of the uh, geoscience analyst project. So going from topography, geology, and then incorporation of geophysical data. And then pit workings. Drill holes. Load models with faults and some geology. So you'll understand that some of these we have a lot more data and some of the data are quite sparse. So you will see some that are huge, huge data sets in the Mineral Deposit Atlas and others that are a bit skinnier, but we're working as hard as we can. And you will actually see during the coming, well, 2023, an update to the Northwest Queensland Mineral Deposit Atlas with uh, new data. So rocks, diagrams, in this case, ultraviolet on the top right. Structural interpretations where we have them. And in some cases, or as many cases as possible, these are included in the geoscience analyst files. But not only that, we're actually heading a bit more down the interpretive space as well. So there are times when we, having gathered all the data, we're actually starting to go into a Queensland-wide style interpretation that is used at different scales for the Atlas. And some of this data will obviously be used as we go towards the next round of Atlases. So getting into the AI space with learning, 
we're actually now getting to the stage where we've collected and compiled enough data to start applying machine learning and things like that to the understanding of our data sets. So where to next? So as of a few weeks ago, we have started the next round of 20 deposits plus the upgrade to the Northwest Mineral Province. And that goes all the way from Weeper in the north. So we include aluminium uh, all the way down through Red Dome, Inersley, Kidston, Balcooma, a little bit out to the west, including Julia Creek. And then um, I suppose what you'd call inland from Townsville, Mount Lation, Pajingo, Mount Carlton, Thalanga Highway Reward in that area, down through Mount Coolan, and then through what I'd call, I suppose, the Bradman-esque in terms of uh, statistics and income, uh, Mount Morgan there, and uh, that's also being worked on by our colleagues in the waste characterisation team. So Mount Morgan will be, we will have another crack at trying to understand how that works. And then down through Krakow, Mount Rawdon, down to Twin Hills, down on the New South Wales border. So over the next, uh, till June 2024, you will see release of more data on those prospect areas. The next 20 months. And those data are held, uh, there's some data held on the SMI website, but you will also find it held on the GSQ website, uh, on the top one, it's actually held as data set number 58, and also 36 is also the code for uh, the Northwest Queensland data set. For some reason, I don't find it quite so easy to find it online, but they're all there, and certainly ping us uh, if you can't find it online. It's a wonderful data set, and I feel privileged to start working on it. So thank you very much indeed. Nick. Um, do we have any questions for Nick on the deposit atlases? No. Excellent. Uh, any questions for any other speakers? Anyone from this morning? Any burning desire to put a question to them here and now? We do have a few minutes, so any question for any speaker? Nick, before you go, um, <laughs> walking out the door there. Um, up and around Weeper, there's a lot of other minerals other than uh, aluminium. Is that something that you'll be looking at from the available data, or will you just be focusing on what it's renowned for? Uh, so we have uh, discussions with GSQ as to what their preferred uh, funding is, I suppose, for and most important areas. Uh, so some of those other areas may be looked at. Um, and if you have proposals for future atlases or areas of interest, then you should bring them to our attention because uh, we're always keen to continue this project. And this is not, in our view, the last of them. And certainly going to areas that are less common would be great for the industry, in my view, in terms of expanding the knowledge outside the known, the, the commonly known areas. So, yeah, by all means, send us and we will create a list. And then next time we get the chance to have the cooperative discussions, we will sort through those lists and say, OK, we'll choose this next next around. Absolutely. But of course, if you wanted SMI to look at the rocks for you, we're always available. We've got a team of geologists and smart people who would Love to come and look at your rocks. Rick and team have have also produced um, a variety of what we've called critical mineral compilation um, projects, and those are also available online. And silica is definitely in on that list. Um, and so, it's actually something we should go back and look at to see if we've got the um, the Western Cape as part of that prospectivity tool. Uh, in addition to the the well the better known things on the eastern side of the Cape as well, so um, the the data will have been captured in some form as it's available. 
the question online for Janelle, but because you know we've done two talks, I feel like I can answer it. So uh, a lot of other people asked uh, what the space in the airborne gravity gradiometry was in Kenobi. Uh, have you tried flying at a higher frequency? Um, that's something. So the the survey was flying at one kilometre line spacing to approximate ground gravity of equivalence of one kilometre station spacing. Um, the problem we always hit as a geological survey is whether we look at covering a broader area at a coarser line spacing or whether we do tighter line spacing to cover a smaller area. Um, I think at the moment that one kilometre line spacing for AGG uh, is appropriate for a geological survey uh, with an exploration survey filling in the gaps between that. Um, but always open to discuss um, that it's always the trade-off of, of coverage versus quality of data. Um, and particularly with the, the depth of the basement there, um, tightening that to, to tighter spacing would probably not create a lot of better gravity data because of the depth of cover in that region anyway. Um, so that was why we chose that one kilometre, um, but we're always open to keep talking about um, the resolution of our, our geophysical programs, our AEM, our airborne gravity gravimetry, or our MAGRAD surveys. The mine vest has been... Um, put in places and um, um, I guess during time with the rain and heat, uh, they can be an oxidizing environment and produce acids, uh, which can be environmentally uh, a hazard because that it can leak and get mixed with uh, underground water or on the surface and gets to river. Uh, and perhaps we have heard a lot of um, these stories around in the last few years, more and more. So that's one problem with uh, mine waste that they can be doing environmentally hazardous. The other thing is, um, which is, this is a newer thing, I guess, is that if you can use the tailings as a new resource and say, in terms of copper, um, we always used, uh, looked at copper, but copper normally, uh, it could be um, um, associated with cobalt. So at the time, nobody was interested in cobalt, so we didn't look for cobalt, we didn't process it. And maybe now we have a lot of cobalt in our tailings. Um, so this is a bit of a, I guess, a newer story with new economy minerals. And um, this uh, image here, I, uh, I, I put it here because it says this is a, our favorite Cam Mary Kathleen mine. And people use it as an um, Instagram hotspot. Uh, yet, yet another uneducated, uh, I guess decision with humankind to take a you know a selfie in front of a uh, uranium mine, but I bet they didn't know that. Um, so my talk, I, I thought that maybe I divided kind of two pieces. Um, one is that geophysical and that geoenvironmental uh, hazard, which I think it's a bit of a more more familiar one. Or if you look at the um, literature, you may find something for that. Um, in terms of tailings management, um, we have now a lot of tailings that they exist. Uh, but if we are trying to, um, I guess, uh, design a new tailings, um, um, could geophysics help with that one? Could geophysics help with the planning and designing a new tailing? Uh, which I um, think... Um, with geophysics, um, there are studies not with tailings, but with other um, areas um, ha has been done that uh, it can help with the regional permeability or um, local porosity of the rocks. For example, there is this uh, good study recently has done, uh, the, 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 in, it has been done in uh, South Australia uh, for Institute mm -hmm. Copper uh, Recovery. It's a site in Kapunda and um, um, it's uh, probably a bit of a similar situation that they put acid, but um, uh, biologically, apparently friendly acid, uh, to uh, get copper. And what they have done, uh, the, the University of South Australia, Graham Heinsen and a few other people, they have used um, audio magnetotelluric and uh, time domain EM and um, nuclear magnetic resonance. And they have been successfully shown that how long depending on how much the rocks can capture that acid, which that's porosity and how much they can let that acid basically leak and move, um, which would be the permeability of the rocks, they have shown that uh, basically uh, how long it takes that the acid uh, uh, gets to the river. So um, with the mine tailings, similar scenario, you can perhaps uh, look at the movement of the acid through geophysics. 
after you make the mine and you know you uh, deposit the tailings and then there's a closure that can be after care and monitor which probably with a lot of tailings at the moment we, we are talking about this part the tailings already exist somewhere and after nobody probably cared about 30 years uh, now you're thinking okay how we can control that and how we can have a better understanding of the tailing um, which it was a bit of a news to myself when I realized that a lot of tailings the deposition history is um, not uh, known but we don't know how much rock we actually deposited so we don't know the volume we don't know where is the bottom of it we don't know um, how much sulfide is in there, if it produces acid. So, again, uh, in the past, there has been some studies uh, with time dominium and DC resistivity um, in terms of aftercare. Um, and so, I guess I'll give you a lot of abbreviations of geophysics um, to make you wake up. But um, now, uh, geophysicists like abbreviations, by the way. Um, TEM is time domain electromagnetic, uh, direct current resistivity and induced polarization, and audio magnetotelluric, and IP is induced polarization. All of these methods, um, I mean, apart from IP, uh, they look at the electrical resistivity and conductivity of the rocks. So, this uh, diagram here on the top is showing the resistivity uh, of uh, rocks and minerals. And, Top is uh, on weather rocks, weather layers, sediments, glacial sediments, sedimentary rocks, and then you have uh, water and aquifers. Um, and then you have, you can see there's a wide range for resistivity or at the bottom conductivity. Um, and the challenge with geophysics, when you're looking at, um, I guess when you're in exploration and you're trying to find a target, the challenge is a lot of times what you're interested in at, like sulfides, can overlap if you're looking at electrical conductivity uh, or electrical resistivity methods, can overlap the resistivity of that target with something like graphite, which is not uh, in your interest. So that becomes a problem. Um, how would you solve that? Uh, in terms of tailings, maybe the scenario is something more closer to that okay. of a aquifer. Okay. You have, you have fresh water. Then you, you have, have some salt in that fresh water. Um, it can become more conductive. And if you can see here, like say fresh water is 100 millisiemens per meter, you can have an order of magnitude if you introduce salt to water. With tailing, there is this thing we call total um, dissolved um, solids, uh, which is, I guess, um, salt and metal and uh, what not, what not ions. ions, so they so can, they can uh, make, make the ground, the ground um, generally, generally speaking, speaking more conductive. Um, so with tailings, um, yeah, that's why electrical resistivity, or I should say EM, sorry, EM methods can be helpful. Um, and yes, so um, now let's see if this moves again. Yeah, it does. So, okay, so far I talked about a bit about environmental problems, but maybe um, in the top, in, in, the, in, in, in this particular study, uh, we, we like also to look at the using the tailings as, a, I guess, a resource. Um, so this table here, the first three columns of it, I got it from a uh, new... Um, Report, I think, 28th month report from Anita Parba Fox and her team uh, from SMI um, that they submitted to GSQ. And what they've done, they've listed all the new economy minerals and they said, okay, uh, which is a very long list, and I have put only cobalt here. And then they said, okay, cobalt, where's the main deposit? These are three types of main deposit you can get cobalt. Um, and um, Actually, can anybody see this when I do that? Where is the laser? Oh, shoot. Well, perfect. How do we do the laser? Oh, yeah. So, um, I guess, yeah, these are main uh, deposit types. And this is a waste type that the deposit, if that is the deposit, that would be the waste. So, what I thought that, okay, if we are exploring, really, um, in normal exploration, the scenario is you look for you know, physical signature of your target. So for the main deposit, I listed what would be the geophysical signature if you are looking at copper. And then if you're looking at copper, what methods you use, and then what would be geophysical signature 
of a waste deposit if you're looking at cobalt. Um, so I come from bottom here. Um, there, where is my laser? It's not very good. So this bottom one, um, it's when you have magmatic nickel copper sulfide as a mm, main deposit. Then for that one, I guess with the geophysical signature, um, you can have all high density, high electrical, uh, quite anomalous, but the problem is you have an intrusive bedrock that they are also very um, geophysic, geophysical, geophysically very anomalous too. And it's quite a challenging target uh, when you're exploring that. So it's like a needle in a haystack. And um, I didn't go through the rest uh, for these two. Um, I just tried to focus on the first one, but I thought um, it's good maybe put them down for now. In future, I maybe start filling them up. Um, with, um, but I also want to point out something here. There's a point here. With the uh, nickel and uh, cobalt laterite, uh, a good method that works really with geophysics is you use GPR. It's because you have a lot of um, lateroid horizons and so there are layers that they are resistive, dense, then they change it, resist there's a change in resistivity or density, then from density again, you get more dense, less dense, more resistive, less resistive. So GPR actually works really well. But just think of that. You have that nice um, lateroid horizons, you get your ore out and then you process it and you put it somewhere and you're looking at something that uh, perhaps doesn't have that um, homogeneity and it's all um, very heterogeneous. So GPR obviously not going to work for you even you have the main waste type as the main deposit type. But with this scenario today that I'm going to talk and I'm going to show you that I'm talking, um, we have um, um, our main deposit type is stratiform sediment hosted copper cobalt. Then our waste would be nickel copper cobalt sulfides. In terms of when, when you are looking at uh, this type of deposits, they are non-magnetic and they have a diluted gravity signature. Uh, they are quite uh, chargeable and they can have low resistivities and uh, probably IP uh, induced polarization at DC resistivity and EM can be very well um, they, they are very well used. Everybody probably in the industry uses them and uh, they're quite successful. The challenge with them is when you look at these deposits for copper, you have charcoal pyrite, which is your economical um, sulfide, and then you have pyrite, which you don't like it, but both of them are chargeable. One more resistive, one less resistive, and one more chargeable. I guess um, charcoal pyrite is more conductive and less chargeable geophysicist thing is less chargeable. If you talk with the mineralogists, uh, that is not given because chargeability is, comes to the grain size and that is not that always charcoal pyrite has lesser of a grain size to pyrite. So if you say to a mineralogist, they probably not like it. So before you drill it, maybe you want to check that fact. <laughs> but um, yes, it comes to the cobalt. I actually think we may have a bit of a chance to this time we got rid of charcoal pyrite right? We wanted it. So probably we don't have as much charcoal pyrite, right? so we have a bit of a maybe less challenge here. And um, I think the resistivity can be high, uh, higher or uh, on higher end uh, comparing with the previous scenario because uh, the cobalt um, in this case in Capricorn copper is mainly associated with pyrites and those pyrites are going to be disseminated. Um, and one thing with conductivity is um, Usually you have con high conductivity if you have um, connected um, minor phases in your grain boundary. Um, so if it is disseminated, you may have um, some chargeable high resistivity, which I'm claiming today here for the <laughs> first time probably. <laughs> um, and uh, there's not much in the literature if you go through this stuff. Um, and probably EM and uh, DC resistivity and IP can be helpful. Um, um, I'm not sure what's not showing yet. Uh, yeah, okay. So I'm going to slide up and down here. Okay. Um, so uh, are, now I'm going to talk about our example, Loop EM survey in Capricorn Copper Tailing Storage Facility. I, I like this image. It's a good one. Um, and I'm going to talk about that image now. Um, Okay, should I talk about it now? 
Lauren, you're very keen. <laughs> um, so yes, this is actually the work that uh, I'm going to talk about it and the data has been collected by Lauren here uh, from SMI, University of Queensland, the PhD student and uh, Roger from GSQ carrying the LUPM equipment. I don't know how many degrees it was, uh, but I'll tell you a bit more later about uh, the detail of survey. It was for Roger that wasn't his PhD. I would say it was a quite a sacrifice to walk <laughs> the pure uh, passion for geophysics. Um, um, now, uh, next, next one. one. Uh, yes. yes. So, so the project, the project is, is part of the Lawrence, Lawrence PhD, PhD um, has, has been funded, been funded by GSQ. GSQ. And because I was in SMI, SMI and was, and was working, working for you, 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 you I'm in GSQ, GSQ, that's, that's why how I'm in the middle of this. Is. Uh, I'm, I'm related, related and related, I guess. Uh, and this, this is, is a map, map that, that I stole, stole from Lauren's uh, confirmation. confirmation. Thank, Thank you, Lauren. Lauren. Um, and uh, she, uh, she has put this nicely, nicely together. But so we're looking at Pran's tailing facility, I guess, tailing storage facility here. And that's from, from Capricorn Copper, Copper uh, which is, uh, which is um, I guess, 120 kilometers north, north west of, of uh, Mount Osa. I'm sorry, I forgot to put something larger. larger. Oh, so everybody, everybody knows where is Capricorn Copper, Copper design. Design. Uh, uh, and, and then there's a lot, a lot of things, things here based, based on, on, I don't know, Creek Dam. These are all from, from the mining, mining previous mining, 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 and it has been done from 1998 to 2009. And we don't know much, I guess, from this history, maybe some. Um, well, some, some, some parts, parts of, of it. it. I guess okay, Lauren, Lauren can if you have questions, yeah. you can ask it. Uh, uh, but but um, if we've been the, the, the survey, survey has done in, in 2021, 2021. Um, um, and then, and then after, after Roger and, and Lauren did the survey, survey I, think I think there was, there was a wall uh, 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 lift was completed in this, this uh, uh, Spranza year, and they put more tailings from different. Deposit, um, um, yeah, deposits, deposits. Um, and, that's and that's one, one thing, thing with tailings is that they mix them up, you know, you know it's, not, it's not, just not just one, so. Uh, I guess I want to go to the next one. Am I in charge of this, this now? Still? I'm not, not sure. sure. So, so that's, that's the top, top is that, that all they have, they have worked around, around that. that. Uh, um, this this here, here, this front was a loop. loop. That's what, what they, they call, call it. Look, this is trans the transmitter is 15 kg, and that's why I told this you this is half 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 because they walked, walked with 15 kg and, and 10 kg here. here Lauren, four days, four days, four days they, walked they walked 44 kilometers to collect, to collect this EM data, data, which was beautiful, beautiful data, and uh, line spacing of five meters and reading every one half meter. I don't know what was in picture plus 40. Okay. The, this, this is isn't what the PhD student is capable, capable of, I'm telling you. Um, um, somebody you know, in my PhD, PhD they, told they told me the PhD, PhD is the project that, that uh, is they offer 98% of people, 100% of people, 98 of them, I'm going to say no, no I'm not going to do, do it. This is a, <laughs> this is a good example. Um, now the next one. I think, I think my, my laptop, laptop is not able to do that, that but this is, yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Well, well, I'm, I'm going, going back. backwards, sorry. Yep. Yep. All right. All right. So, so this, this is the part you're going to follow. I couldn't um, resist. Sorry, I'm a dual physicist. But, but um, yeah, yeah, I, need I need you to say, talk a little bit about LUPM. Is that my time up? Almost? Okay. So, now, um, we, we're, we're not going to bother you so much about, about what is EM, um, um, but, but um, I, guess I guess you have, have a signal, you record, you record your signal, signal in some decay of voltages. Yep. Yes. Um, you, have you have a receiver, receiver loop, you, you have, have a conductor, conductor um, a transmitter loop, and you, you have, have a some 10 on and 10, 10 off here, here in case of this equipment, equipment 9 a second. You have some voltages that you have to collect. I really like this other thing here, but... These are, These are more about, about the resolution, resolution. If you have question, you can ask, ask me this one. one. Um, then, then I'm, I'm going to show you the conductivity depth, depth images, images um, that they that are they from Emacs A. Um, 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 and, and <laughs> okay. Um, the conductivity the depth images from Emacs A is not. This is just I was trying to explain what's happening. 
when we produce that, um, it's not an inversion, it's a just um, depth transform. Um, and the strength and limits of uh, um, conductivity of depth in the earth, quick, quick, first pass into interpretation. Reliable, reliable for the geology, but if you have, have and it's easy to adjust for uh, different survey combinations, but if you have a two-d feature, like a four or three-d feature, um, you, know, you know, a this discrete conductor, conductor it would be hard, hard um, to, restore to restore them, and you may get some distortion, or you may get some exaggeration with the depth. depth. Say so you, you have a conductor that, that looks like a plate, plate and it's close to the ground, you have a twin pick, but, but with the CR, you may get two twin pick, and you may get a bit of it. So... I, I, don't I don't think, think we can take much, much now, now, but still, still um, I, think I think we got, got something. something. Um, so, so I was. Uh, I, am I am trying, trying to show you. you. I, guess I guess I have, I have to stop sharing. sharing. Oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, mm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, then you, yeah, you do it. Do it. So, so I'm using geoscience, geoscience and I'm the only, the only brave, brave person, person that is trying to use it live. It just uh, tells you I'm a risk taker, obviously. Or um, I don't know probably what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm trying to show. Uh, do I need to share again? I, I don't see the top presenting. What should I do, Matt? Yeah, you do it. Uh, just maybe stop sharing and then share it again. Share again. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Uh, yep, yeah, so that's what we got here, I guess. Uh, it's a bit. Yeah. Can you see it? Uh -huh. So yes, that's where we are. Um, I, um, and uh, I can show you the topography. Um, looks like something like this. So this area, obviously, they are a bit lower. And this area is a bit higher. I guess I exaggerated them a bit. Um, and the data... Um, for, I, I have a few channels of the EM data here that I thought maybe I can show, maybe it'd be worth showing. Um, although I couldn't tell you much about what it means. Um, so the red colors are usually associated with more conductive colors and the blue more resistive. The, this is a channel five um, Z response and um, the earlier time perhaps reflects on um, um, shallower parts. Uh, so from channel five, if I jump to channel 10, for example, you see a bit of a change here, you get more uh, resistive. And then if I channel 10 to 15, you see it all becomes conductive. But this is only the data. So um, you need to basically model it. There's no association really with depth or anything like that. Um, then I guess what I would like to show you here is a bit of a actual the CDI or conductivity depth images that they are basically somehow um, similar to uh, 1D inversions. Um, and if I remove that one, so we turn this on. And from this side, if you look at this, uh, maybe I remove that one. See, there is a conductor layer on the top. It's kind of consistent. Uh, the depth of it is one to seven meter. Then you have a resistive layer with the blue. Then you have a bit of a conductor. And you see these two kind of a, it's, it's a round uh, shape, um, kind of a boundary here, which when I showed Lauren, he was a, she was a bit terrified I would say she thought this is weird which I agree because it just um, looks a bit uh, strange this way when you look at it uh, and then further you go it gets a bit more conductive which is uh, that is where the dam I guess it's there's already you can see even at the images there is a bit of a liquid um, here at the surface which I don't know what it is exactly um, but um, 
if you look at the north-south slices, I like those better that can tell us a bit more. If you look at this way, it's kind of a quite mess. You don't see much. But if you turn it around from this side, and I put this on again, um, maybe 10, 10 is better, channel 10. Um, you can see there is quite a um, short boundary here that is from 30 meter down to 57 meter or 60 meter that uh, can show the, you know, you have a conductive, a bit more resistive, resistive, and then there's a conductor that's quite nicely sitting here as a layer. Um, so either it's um, a static water level or it can be uh, the boundary between the two uh, deposit, the mammoth and uh, Spranza, which one, I guess Spranza has more clay. So and I apparently was put first down here. It can be between the boundary between these two. We still don't know, but um, it kind of shows that from this side of a dam when you move towards this end, there's a bit of a change if you look at it this way. Uh, yeah. And I guess um, um, uh, what the c conclusion or what I think, it's not a conclusion, really, it's what I think at the moment we got is that, uh, you know, we have lots of pyrite. Um, Lauren has done some uh, mineralogy. Uh, there are some samples uh, from 10 meters. Uh, there's a lot of pyrites. Uh, at the time, there was a lot of pyrites. Uh, the pyrites are quite disseminated. And, um, you know, thinking of that, we don't have also probably as much charcoal pyrite and clay from what she has uh, looked up, which I think I put it in here, if I can show you. Uh, so this is what uh, Lauren has done. There's a lot of uh, pyrite in the samples, but not that much, as much charcoal pyrite or clay minerals. So um, in terms of what we are seeing, we might be able to interpret this later uh, when we get our um, you know, 3D model. Also, it would be good to DC and IP surveys in next tailings. Uh, I guess this one we can't because they, I guess they put some stuff there at the moment is not accessible anymore, but yeah, and that's the reference for Jovi's signature table. You have questions? You can ask Lauren. <laughs> that's it, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Thank, thank you, Sasha, and, and well done uh, managing the uh, the interruptions with your with your talk there. Um, do we have any? Yeah, Atom, a question. Sorry, man. Thank you. I find it very interesting the geophysics um, and exciting science. Uh, I have a data when you were presenting the basics. You know, the water is very conductive, especially if it's salty water. If it's full of sulfides, it's gonna overrun many times any other rock or material. So when you sample tailings dams, obviously it's um, full of salts mm. and the moisture level varies, can vary dramatically depending on the mm. deposition type. So you have you can have you know sandy layer, then clay layer, then sandy layer, then clay layer. So the moisture will be all over the you know the, as you go with depths can vary dramatically. So what does this mean for your for your readings if you don't know the moisture content? Yeah, how reliable your data is. You know, that's that's def definitely um, a hard one. That uh, there was this method that I pointed at the nuclear magnetic resonance um, that actually can pick up on the uh, porosity of the rocks, and that can help a bit. Um, in that particular study, it needs geo. Uh, if you ask me, it needs hydrogeological modeling. You need a hydrogeologist um, to come, and you know, you put all this together. You can't. I don't think. You can do it just if you have your EM data and sit there. Oh, okay, I know that I've got um, cobalt, um, but certainly that's um, yeah, that's something to think. Because I think it's quite challenging to interpret this stuff, uh, especially with exploration. If you look at normal exploration or traditional or whatever we have done so far, there's always drill holes and. Uh, I guess our uh, solution is always drill more, right? Uh, so you can always at least compare what you find with something. With this one, I don't know. Um, and the, the samples, um, it's 10 meters uh, that we've done. So you can drill. You can start drilling on this EM. <laughs> Work and see what happens. <laughs> Very good. So we'll have to um, wrap that one up. But thank you sure. again, Sasha, for your talk. I'd now like to welcome to the stage... Uh, Callum Spink. Callum is the principal geologist from Pack Gold. 
uh, unlocking an entire gold corridor, Alice River Gold Project. Welcome, Callum. Righto, you might have to show me how this works because everybody seems to be struggling with it forward and back. Looks to uh, make a bit of sense. Yeah, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for having us along. Um, I am the principal geologist for Pat Gold, and uh, I know there's a few interested people in the room um, regarding this particular project because, uh, yeah, it's been unlocked. Well, it's been locked up for quite a number of years. It hasn't had any systematic exploration on it until recently. So this talk aims to share with you some of our recent successes. I hope some of you guys have been looking at the ASX because this is one of Queensland's success stories. I sound like a salesman, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been a fun journey and um, it's going to be an interesting couple of years. But what I'm hoping to show you is how we're yeah, unlocking a major gold corridor by using modern exploration techniques. And uh, as I say, it's, it's shaping up to be something quite prolific. Pat Gold is a gold exploration company with work focused up in far north Queensland, at Alice River. As you can see from the map, we're located in a highly endowed area of Queensland, with over 40 million ounces mined to date. Uh, we listed on the ASX in July 2021, and on the back of the success of our first drill program, we made a high gold grade discovery. Some of the results you can see on the board, in the interest of time, I won't read them out. This success resulted in us being the best performing IPO, uh, gold IPO on the ASX for 2021-2022. And that's something to uh, be pretty proud of because um, it's no small feat, particularly given those, those years. Our success is underpinned by the application of new ideas to the projects, new exploration techniques, some old-fashioned geology, and a bit of out-of-the-box thinking. Um, so the Alice River project resides in the Cape York Peninsula, in particularly within the southern Savannah province, a north-south trending uh, belt that forms the western part of the Cohen Inlier. The belt includes units of protozoic sediments, intrusives and metamorphic units, which have been intruded by late Silurian to early Devonian granitoids, which are part of the Cape York Peninsula Baffalift suite. We, uh, like most people in Queensland, do have uh, parts of the project that are covered by early sedimentary sequences, which make it difficult. But yeah, Jurassic uh, sandstone could turn your allu uh, alluvium. So multiple regional deformation events in the Proterozoic and early Paleozoic helped form major northwest trending myelinitic shear zones. And these were reactivated across the region around the early Devonian. The Siluro-Devonian granites at the Alice River Gold Project are cut by a series of faults within the Alice River uh, within the Alice Palmer structural zone, and of particular interest to us is the Alice River shear zone. These faults contain gold mineralization in several places, which was emplaced during the early Permian, hydrothermal gold event that we see hosting a multitude of deposits across the Cohen Inlier. The Alice River shear zone across our tournament portfolio is in excess of 30 kilometers. The photograph on the left gives you an overview of the projects and where we are. There is an old open pit in the centre right of that photo. It produced about 30,000 ounces of 5.5 grams per tonne in the late 90s. Pat Gold uh, now owns the project 100%, and that comes with eight granted mining leases and five exploration permits. And as you would know, um, many of you would know, there are many benefits associated with granted mining leases, which obviously gives us the ability to fast track some development scenarios. Gold was first discovered uh, by John Dickey, Scottish geologist, in 1903. The most significant exploration was completed by Cypress Gold in the early 80s. However, for the last 20 years, the project's been uh, had limited exploration, mainly because it was owned by a private prospector. And then we purchased the project in 2020. Uh, where are we? Slide seven. Yeah. Uh, this is the extent of our granted EPMs and our EPM applications. I want to draw your attention to the scale bar in the bottom left-hand corner of that image, um, which is 10 kilometers. We currently have 30 kilometers of strike tied up with numerous historical prospects. Our focus has been concentrated on a seven kilometer zone, which you can see in the right-hand picture, in particular at the central target where most of the drilling from 2022 has taken place. There has been a lot of rab drilling historically in the late 80s, which focused on some scattered anomalies. Even to the south on our southern target, historically, there's drill intercepts there at eight metres at 55 grams a tonne, and these prospects haven't had a drill hole in 30 years. Um, and as I said, it's our objective to join the dots and unlock the major goldfield up at Alice River. Um, so what's part of our strategy? 
Well, one of the things we did was to use data that was probably not considered important at the time. One of the things we realized early on in the project that it had good IP data, and that was inquire, uh, acquired in the late 1980s. We knew the IP should be uh, should work, or at least be interesting, as it's been a successful exploration tool in Queensland and many other gold deposits. And as a plus, it was free. Uh, we reprocessed the gradient array IP and immediately noticed that the resistivity lows were highlighting an extensive structural zone that was hosted in our gold mineralization. The unaltered granites are resistive highs, and hydrothermally altered granite along the Alice River structure are resistive lows, pretty simple. This strong anomalous corridor of resistivity low signature has been defined over seven kilometers. Unfortunately for those before us, they had done what many would do with that data, particularly back then, and that was to focus on the shallow chargeability highs in the search for bulk tonnage deposits without much luck. They actually concluded that the IP data was not a useful exploration tool. Realizing that the gradient array produced an excellent resistivity contrast, we decided that we needed to do our own and follow this up with our own pole dipole IP. To answer the question, what does it look like in 3D? What does it look like in depth? And are there any other structures or intrusives that are undercover or less pronounced? And like the gradient array, our results highlighted the significant resistivity low across the corridor. We now have high resolution, 150 to 180 meter deep sections across our main targets. Um, for those that are interested, we've just finished up at Alice River because the wet season's dawned upon us, um, but we've just finished a, uh, our 2022 IP survey this month, which extends that data out to 12 kilometers, which is really exciting. Um, and infills around that northern target, you can see it's a little bit sparse in that picture. And between us, the preliminary data is continuing to highlight the mineralized corridor across our other prospects, which is really exciting and will definitely give us a few more targets. So this is, this is one of our drill sections, and you can see on the left-hand image, the IP really shows a strong correlation with the drilling. It shows the shear zone continues to depth, and that this is confirmed by our high-grade results from our follow-up drilling. The IP is helping us to define large zones of potential mineral mineralization at the coincidence of this boundary. One of the other things we're doing, as I said at the beginning, is going back to some grassroots exploration and old, old well, just geology, and that's just through systematic geological mapping and sampling programs. We're also doing a number of detailed petrological studies. Historically, there was no multi-element geochem data ever taken, uh, and that was just a, a factor of budget at the time and what people were looking for. And obviously, as we all know, it's so important to have multi-element geochem data to understand intrusion-related gold systems, uh, particularly in this day and age. We've classified multiple vein phases and mineralization assemblages that I'd obviously love to go through by just looking at the rocks and just having boots on the ground geologist. We know the importance of good geochemical data and we've actually done four acid ICPMS on a significant portion of our samples to study pathfinder element associations, alteration halos and mineralization zonation. So we're very, very fortunate. Another one of our early observations was that there was large areas of the project we never that were never drilled. There's gaps in the auger gold data. In particular, we look between our central and uh, well, our central and southern target. And we realized that the basement was being masked by Jurassic sandstone cover, and that the historic auger sampling through the sandstone doesn't highlight the true AU potential. And so this was just us getting out on the ground and going, wait a minute, this is sandstone. So the, they might have confused the sandstone with the granite, um, which is not hard when you're doing some of this stuff out there. So early on in the project, it was realized that understanding the host structure would be would greatly expedite our geological understanding. So it's obviously hosted within the Alice River shear zone, which is a complex fault. And so we understood uh, right from the beginning that we couldn't just come in here with old ideas and start drilling this thing with RC because we're not going to really be able to understand the kinematics and what's driving the gold and which orientation it's all sort of in. And so yeah, we came in and we've uh, been very fortunate to have opted with triple tube HQ to maximize not only our orientations, which is probably the most important thing out there, but also recoveries. And this has been absolutely pivotal to understanding and modeling. So again, another, uh, another fortunate thing that we've been able to do, unlike some companies. Uh, well, it's just a factor of budget, right? Uh, so one of the things we did want to do early on uh, was to try and understand Alice River, not just locally in reference to the other 
deposit styles in the Cohen Inlier and those across Queensland, but was just to look at all major deposit types. And maybe I should go and have a look at that atlas later on as well. And that's just to advance our own ideas and, and take other people's observations from similar rock types and similar geophysics and sort of apply it back to ours. One of the models that we're sort of looking at at very early stage is the Donlan Creek in Alaska. While it is a 30 million ounce deposit, and uh, it's a little bit optimistic at this stage to say we've got the same thing, but we do draw a lot of similarities in regards to the sort of metallurgy, the veining assemblages, and where the gold is sort of hosted. So that's quite exciting for us, and we're obviously open to working out what best describes this deposit, and it might it might be unique um, to Queensland, and it may form its own um, part of that right-hand diagram. Um, so this is a planned section, long section through the central target. That's been our main focus for the years because it's where the old open pit was. Um, the section on the right shows our deepest hole, which returned a very encouraging intercept of four meters at 10.3. So that's pretty cool, right? We drilled a 520 meter vertically deep hole and hit uh, quite a nice intercept, really nice veining, bit of brecciation. As we go deeper, what we've noticed is that we move away from a lower grade black silica into a later stage gold bearing solution. Uh, that seems to be a little bit higher temperature. Again, it's sort of honoring that model that we're trying to compare it to. I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty excited for next year because I'm definitely going to convince the board to drill a hole deeper than this as well and really see how deep this thing goes. We, uh, We've done a lot in two years. We've actually drilled 20,000 meters since the IPO. I mean, we're a junior company with a market cap of 20 to $30 million. So to have three or four rigs on site this year was pretty exciting. Um, it's not often in, in a small company you get to do that and the IP and all the other things that come along with it. Um, this is our most re recent long section, bearing in mind we're obviously still waiting for a few assays to be returned. You'll see the extents to which we've gone with drilling since acquiring the project. I mean, we've decided to pepper it and follow our hypothesis and look for gold-bearing shoots. And um, the thing that they did historically, with like a, a lot of other deposits I've worked at as well, is they've they've drilled it to 100 meters and walked away. And that was the rationale at the time as they were looking for, they were looking for open pits. And uh, all we had to do was... Um, put a cheeky hole underneath and uh, lo and behold it continues to depth and it looks to be improving as we go down the this is a, another prospect just south of where we are it's a, it's a pretty cool picture we're looking at about two and a half kilometers a strike this 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 area hasn't been drilled in 30 years historically like the rest of the project there's been a lot of shallow drilling the average historical drill holes 40 meters i'm happy to say that we just completed two diamond holes which are the deepest holes on this pros uh, on this particular prospect. This is the first time it's had a dr uh, diamond drilling on it, which again is very exciting because you look at the veining on surface, but it look it does look different in drill core. And uh, the northern hole of those two contain visible gold and significant veining. So that's a bit of a win. Obviously, eagerly waiting the results for that one. Um, Pat Gold has had, ha had an exciting two years with a strong discovery-focused team and a healthy budget. Um, and obviously an exciting gold project. One of the things I appreciate about the company and one of the things we're, we're not afraid to do is draw on the expertise of those in the industry. Some of you guys in the room may, may, may or may not be familiar with the project, but we're working alongside many consultants and experts in this style of mineralization and uh, Queensland geology, and we hope to do a lot of uh, work with Resources Queensland because I know they're gagging to get our core and have a look at our database, which I definitely will be providing at some stage in the next six months. Um, but yeah, we've also got really great relationships with local landholders, traditional owners, and local businesses that make up this part of the world. It's obviously not easy doing exploration in Cape York. As I said, we've just had, uh, we've just had the, the rain start a little bit early this year than we would have liked. But by applying modern exploration uh, techniques, looking at things a little bit differently, I mean, things have advanced definitely in the last 20 or 30 years. And, uh, Obviously, the gold price is a big driver behind our appetite to get in there as well. But we've unlocked what is a continuous structural corridor with enormous gold potential. Our strategy is to identify and follow the high-grade zones to depth at the central target. What we've learned over the past 6 to 12 months has been vast. In particular, the geometry and controls on this high-grade. Our focus has been on the central target, and with the lessons learned from here, we hope to uh, take that geological model and the one we develop over the next uh, four months while we're at home, working from home and going through all the data that we've collected. Um, yes, yeah, to be able to take that geological model, go down to the other prospects and uh, apply it there as well. And 
as I say, what was previously looked like uh, looked at as single little prospects, we've actually linked it over 30 Ks. And uh, I think that's pretty significant for North Queensland because if you look at these things in WA, they often host million ounce ore bodies every couple of kilometers. So we just never know our luck. I'd like to thank everybody for their time. Uh, if anyone's got any questions, hit me up after as we're running out of time. That's great. Thanks so much, Callum. I'd now like to call up uh, Mick Mullins, Executive Chairman, West Cape Sands, another project in the north. Mick will be talking, not all sands are created equal. Welcome, Mick. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for hanging around. I'd like to... Uh, this, this is a very dry topic for this time slot, I have to tell you. And Evan promised me something after lunch and now uh, Mate, come on, you're telling me it's 4.30 and people are talking about sand. But I want to go through the uses, the sources, the prices as all sort of background material and then talk to you a little bit, our, little bit about our project. One of the big uses of, um, of sand is land reclamation. This is a project um, that a lot of you would be familiar with, the Singapore Casino, which is all fully built on reclaimed land. Um, other countries across Asia are also doing a lot of re land reclamation as well. A big use of sand is construction materials for concrete mainly. Um, to give you a really interesting stat, between 2011 and 2013, over that three-year period, the um, China poured 6.6 .6 gigatons of concrete, which is more than the USA had poured during the entire 20th century. So there is a massive amount of sand being sucked out of the world, uh, continuing into the um, concrete space, and there doesn't seem to be any alternative on the horizon. There is a bit of recycled glass going into concrete, but it's a drop in the ocean. The main use um, for high-grade silica is for industrial uses and for manufacturing. So where does it all come from? This picture uh, is the sort of picture that could be across many parts of Asia, whether it be Sri Lanka, India, uh, or Malaysia, or Vietnam. Uh, if you're in the, if you've got a 20 litre bucket uh, in Vietnam, you're in the sand business. It just, Every creek gets dredged with a guy in a bucket, goes into a canoe, and then the canoe goes downstream into a tinny, and then the tinny goes downstream into a barge that sits there and waits for a big barge to come along from Singapore and to pick it up. The Singaporean government reported, sorry, the Vietnamese government reported exports of sand from Vietnam a few years back of one million tonnes, Plus it might be one million cubic metres. And in the same year, uh, Singapore reported importing five million cubic metres. So the Vietnamese government immediately shut down the sand export business, uh, and as only you could do in a, in a communist country, which created opportunities for some other businesses that I'm involved in, and we started exporting some sand uh, to the Philippines. But that company has eventually reopened uh, and a whole new series of permits and a whole new series of um, bribes has sort of reopened that market progressively, uh, starting with the state-owned um, resources. This sort of uh, raping and pillaging of uh, sand from beaches obviously is not something that we can do here in Australia. Um, but moreover, it's something that is being outlawed and being monitored more and more uh, in other countries as well. Sand quarrying from generally from river flats and floodplains and that sort of thing. Uh, sand dredging. Uh, this is actually a photo I took uh, on the Mekong Delta in Vietnam. It looks like if you put another thimble full of sand on that barge, it would go under but it's simply, as I said, waiting for the big mothership to come along. Some people crush hard rock quartz to create silica, and then there's silica sand mining. And I'm involved in sand quarrying and sand dredging 
But over the years, I've moved up the value chain. And that's why I'm now um, – the first – my first experience in mining was actually buying the second biggest silica sand mine in, in Queensland after Cape Flattery, which was up in Bundaberg, Sun State Sands. And then after that, had a series of hard rock and uh, sand quarries. So I'm very, very familiar with the concrete market, very familiar with basic uh, high-end um, sand uses for foundries and grouts and uh, renders and all sorts of different things. And I've come to the conclusion that I'm not interested in being in any of those markets. Where I want to be is in the silica market. And here's a couple of reasons why. The reclamation sand market, uh, the value is about $5 a tonne. And I call the users in this space YP zeros. They have a very tight specification. So they want your sand yesterday, it has to be perfect, and they don't want to pay you anything for it. So not actually your classic sort of target ideal customer. Construction materials, $15 to $25 a tonne, depending upon where you are and how much competition there is in the market. And uh, the silica market runs anywhere from sort of, you know, $25 a tonne up to well above $1,000 a tonne. So if you want to raise capital and you want to be internationally competitive, you need to obviously be in a market where there's a high value product. What are the critical numbers for silica? First of all, it's the silica percentage. Secondly, it's the iron percentage. And thirdly, they want to know what makes up the other little bit. So a typical sand result uh, might be, say, a 99.5% silica, um, say, 100 parts per million iron, and they want to know what that other little bit is. And there's a reason for that. Whatever you have in the sand ends up in the glass. So a lot of you are familiar with this building. It's Waterfront Place in Brisbane. And interestingly, you cannot get from Waterfront Place down to the river because the eastern side of the building is completely blocked off. The western side of the building, until recently, had a, a big shade sail complex over the, over the forecourt, and that's been replaced by a permanent structure now. And the reason for that is that the sand source that went into making the panels of glass on that building had little bits of boron in it. And in the smelter, a bit like in Terminator 2, where you sort of see those things that looked a bit like mercury coming together, the boron um, finds itself in the smelter and you end up with a little speck of boron in a pane of glass and you can't actually even see it. But on a hot summer's Brisbane day, that little piece of boron expands and expands and expands and it expands beyond the expansion of the glass and that pane of glass shatters into a million pieces and it showers glass down on the people below, and it scares the living daylights out of the person whose office it is. So anybody who's doing facade glass or anything where that can... You, you'll hear occasionally people say, a panel of my pool fence exploded the other day. There was no one even standing anywhere near it. Well, that's the sort of thing we're talking about. So anybody that's interested in high-performance glass or high-performance silica manufacturing is interested in what's in that other little bit. So if it's something like nickel or boron or, or something like that that's going to survive the process, they want to know. And obviously, your price is impacted accordingly. From Australia, it's not viable to ship anything to Asia for uh, land reclamation. The shipping price is just too great. For quarried products and locally dredged products and that sort of thing, the road transport limit is usually about 50 kilometres because usually there's another supply of sand somewhere within that within that range. Or alternatively, beyond about 50 kilometres, the transport cost ends up being more than the underlying product value. Shipping of low-grade sands for the concrete market and that sort of thing to Asia is also not economic for the same sort of reason that the shipping price is dramatically more than the, the value of the product. But shipping of high-value sands to Asia and broader markets is viable. Um, 
one of the businesses I'm involved in dredges sand in Moreton Bay and we were exporting that sand to the Philippines. And during COVID, the shipping price went from $20 a tonne US to $60 a tonne US. So overnight, that business was over. Uh, and all of our customers said, look, sorry, Mick, you know, we've got alternative sources out of Vietnam and other places. We were delivering a product for about $40 US. So we made about 20, shipped at about 20, and that price doubled overnight. So we are always going to be vulnerable to that shipping price. The current market for silica, the threshold number is about 100 parts per million iron in your sand. If you do that, you're in, congratulations, you're in the glass and foundry markets and you'll get about 50 bucks a tonne and you'll make about 20 to 30 bucks a tonne out of that. If you get down to below 50 parts per million, then you'll, you'll get 100 bucks and you'll make about 70 bucks a tonne. And for that market, you're into sort of, um, you're moving into the solar panel and high specification glass markets. And if you're down below 20 ppm, uh, then you're really looking at uh, computer chips and um, other really super high-end um, uh, applications. And that pricing is sort of generally around a thousand bucks a ton, and you'll probably make about nine hundred bucks a ton, Aussie. Our project for Westcape Sands is north of Weeper. And it is south of an Aboriginal community called Mapoon. And Mapoon was settled in the late 1800s by some uh, Presbyterian missionaries who worked with the local um, Indigenous communities and built all sorts of things. And as recently as 1962, um, no disrespect to our host today, but the Queensland government moved in and relocated the entire Aboriginal community to a place called New Mapoon up near the tip of Cape York at Bamaga, and a lot of the locals didn't want to go. So the Queensland Police and representatives from Camalco and the Queensland Government went into town and burned everybody's house down and burned down the church and the town hall and everything else. So it's got a bit of a check at history, and uh, I've been working with uh, those people uh, the traditional owners there for a couple of years now and have been uh, working on a developing a strong relationship and the town's resettled and it's a vibrant, small operating community um, which doesn't see many of the issues that we see in some of the other Aboriginal, Aboriginal communities in Cape York. The site itself is, the southern end of our site is a place called the Pennyfather River and the northern end of our site uh, or the northern end of uh, the landmass there goes into a place called Port Musgrave. But the box running parallel to the coast is a 17-kilometre long sand dune, which is about a kilometre wide and about 25 metres high. So at probably, everyone's doing the math in their head, it's about 200 million cubes, uh, sorry, about 200 million tonnes if, we, if we're able to grab a sort of 12-metre strata out of the pile. Port Musgrave has this wonderful opening and Cullen Point is right out there at the at the headland. And about 40 metres offshore here, we're in about 50 metres, sorry, 15 metres of water. I'll be looking to bring in ships that are about a handy sized vessel, 50, 60,000 tonnes, and we draw 11 metres. And I've got about 800 metres to turn a ship around in and I've got about, um, and the ships are about 200 metres long. And that wharf, just to give you an idea, is 265 metres long and 50 metres wide, just to give you some sort of sense of scale, because everything up there is big. And you sort of look at uh, the location of the township and the, where the Cullen Point is, and you think, oh, gee, that's going to be a bit of a visual issue. But when you get up there and you drive from Mapoon to Cullen Point, it takes you about 15 minutes at 80 kilometres an hour. So... Everything, when you look at Google Earth and everything else, it just, there is nothing like actually being on the ground and seeing what's really going on. So we've got our exploration permit. We've got our, um, our 
preliminary drilling program underway this um, year in 2022, and we've had our metallurgy test results back. And I don't know. Oh, yeah, you should be able to read most of that. Um, if you go to the uh, the iron FE203 and you look at the bottom line, it says sub 10. So we've got 88% of our of our sample passing coming in at an iron level, which is sort of sub 10. And if you remember back, you know, sub 20, you're in the computer chip market. That requires an acid leach, but if we simply go back to uh, minimal processing with some gravity separation, uh, then we're at the 50 ppm mark, which is the solar panel sort of industry. Um, you could have mulled me over when I got these results. I had no idea that we were going to be able to achieve this outcome. Uh, you would have all, you know, given all of our backgrounds, we're all interested in the movie Giant with James Dean and, you know, he strikes the oil and it comes flying out the top of the oil rig and he's made his fortune. Well, this is the moment for a sand guy. That's as exciting as it gets. When we're looking at, uh, so that product there is a 99.95% uh, product. If we take out the titanium and the alumina and bring down the calcium carbonate a bit, we're probably looking at a 99.99% product. And those extraction of those other minerals wasn't the target of our metallurgy work, but there are known technologies to extract those things relatively easily. Um, and this pricing here is uh, from the recent Green Tech prospectus. Um, I'm always uh, intrigued when people price these things because I've actually never met anybody that pays a thousand dollars a ton for sand. Um, but they're out there apparently, and apparently, if you get that even better, then you'll get eight or twelve thousand um, dollars a ton for sand. Um, the difficulty with those markets is that the pricing model is like a pyramid. So there's a massive market for for glass. You know, I've got a, a, a standing order uh, in my capital raising document for 400,000 tonnes a month um, for glass sand, so 5 million tonnes a year. Uh, you go up into the solar panel market, still a big market, growing at 25% per annum, but is a smaller market. Well, the computer chip market, from what I under understand, is maxed out at about a million tonnes a year globally because if you think about it, that makes a lot of tiny little computer chips. So I'm not going to think that I'm going to be able to sort of waltz in and, and take 100,000 tonnes of that market overnight. So I need to be realistic about what the markets are and who's out there to buy my product. I was talking to Helen um, at lunch today, and this this environmental and social governance is just permeating everything that's going on around the world. And the US government recently seized a whole lot of polysilicon, which had been made in some of the western provinces provinces of China. And the suggestion was that it was made by enslaved Muslim um, Chinese. And it wasn't sort of returned or anything. It was just seized. And going forward, there's a ban on on um, importing to the United States that polysilica product from uh, from China. And so, where that's headed for me is that I'm working with a renewable energy fund that is investing in building solar farms and wind farms and, and all sorts of things because they have to reach down through their supply chains to make sure that there is complete providence for the supply lines. So you have an investment fund that invests in a specialist renewable energy investment fund and the people who are investing in the investment fund want to make sure that, that there's no big environmental concerns and there's no big um, slavery issues and whatnot. So they impose that on the on the renewable energy fund that's going to go out and build these projects. 
which they then impose on the solar panel manufacturer, the wind farm um, turbine guys and, and whatever else. And so to ensure a supply of raw materials to the polysilicon manufacturers that then supply the solar panel manufacturers, I've got a term sheet on my desk from a renewable energy fund uh, for investment. So I've got to tell you, um, I did not see that coming. Uh, but uh, at this stage, um, mm. with what I think is some fairly turbulent economic times ahead, uh, I'm pretty excited about being fully funded through to the issue of a mining lease and hopefully a, an approval for a deep water bulk port. Um, one other quick um, thing to note is that we there's this Queensland piece of legislation called the Sustainable Ports Act, which has banned the establishment of any new port from the tip of Cape York down the east coast down to the bottom of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, which is sort of south of um, Lady Elliot Island, just off Bundaberg. So if you're looking to develop a silica project, it's inevitable that you've got to go somewhere where you can build a port because the biggest silica mine in the world, the Cape Flattery, is right next to a deep water bulk port. So that's why we've ended up down the west coast of Queensland because that piece of legislation um, makes it impossible to get product out uh, of the east coast. And we've identified a number of resources, some which are viable, some which aren't, some which are now national parks. Um, but it... Um, but that's how we ended up in that part of the world. I'll be back next year to talk about uh, this other project. So my exploration permit is the is the solid line, as you would all know, and the dotted line is a very large kale and clay deposit that was formerly drilled by Kamalco, and we just have an inkling that it's just chock-a-block full of rare earths. So more on that to come. Well, for those of you who don't know who Critical Minerals Group are, we're about a year and a half old, um, just recently listed on the ASX. And as people have talked about this morning, um, about Critical Minerals of Northwest Mineral Province and Julia Creek and Vanadium, that's us. So our flagship is a vanadium deposit. We have other projects as well, copper and gold, and uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. I don't have too much technical things to go through today, so sorry. I do have some call cool photos, and hopefully that's enough to suffice, but it's just a general company update. So at, at the company, we're, we are really focused on trying to leave a legacy and accelerate the energy transition, so we want to be suppliers of minerals that are going to be critical to a sustainable future, and that's what we're trying to achieve, um, and we'll leave that with our flagship. Uh, as mentioned, we only uh, just recently listed on the ASX, listed in at the end of September. Um, that's already out of date. We're currently at 22 cents, so 9.7 odd million market cap, which is quite small for uh, where we are. But in the current market, being as poor as it is, we're doing well to be trading over our initial listing price. What you will see in there as well is uh, our major shareholder being Itamitsu. Um, well, it's probably, oh, I can hear the volume now. Yeah. Um, it's an indicative of, of larger companies now of recognising the space of critical minerals and wanting to invest and transition into that space. And we're fortunate enough to be probably one of the first globally to have a tier one mining firm invest into us in an IPO. So we look forward to working with those guys and developing our project into, into production. So I'll go through the board quickly. Alan Broom, our chairman, our Order of Australia. Me, I'm a geo, so I've got a bit of technical background. Uh, Art Malone, and now we've also got Steve Kovac, which is the CEO of Itamitsu on our board as well. Um, that's our flagship project there at Julia Creek. As you can see, the southern portion is intersected by road and rail. Um, when we took this to market for the IPO, we took it with 210 million tonnes um, jork resource at 0.39%. We, um, we also, it's outcrops at, at surface, so it's shallow, 
uh, as well. We had a cutoff grade for our resource. I'll go to that in a moment in a, in a cross section. And we also have the potential for high purity aluminium and molybdenum as well. And we'll talk on that a bit as well. And I'll show a bit later as well how this style of geology is probably more superior to the, any other style of hard rock or vanadium style of uh, deposits. Not just for us, but for the whole Julie Creek region. Uh, since listing, we've also put three more applications in the region uh, away. Um, all have, I think there's about 84 drill holes in that in those three applications. All show vanadium content, all show it in the uh, surface or just below surface as well. So again, shallow. We'll look to bolster that. We'll do a resource definition on that and look to bolster our resource base behind our flagship as we develop that. So here's a cross section from the resource looking uh, generally north south. As you can see, it's a seam like deposit, so it's amenable to bulk open pit mining. Um, what this, I suppose, has on compared to the hard rock guys or style of deposit is it's a soft ore, it's very friable, you can break it with your hand. So free dig, no blasting, um, low strip ratio. So th therefore, you already got a, a better OPEX there, but the processing itself is much more simplified. It's uh, simple beneficiation. What you have there is we've got three main pliers within the seam. The top yellow one is a limestone dominant with a little bit of shale. The middle orange is a limestone shale into bedded um, with more vanadium content, and the bottom one is a shale unit. When we defined our uh, resource model, what we did as a as a cutoff is if we hadn't hit the resource by 35 metres, any part of it, it wasn't considered part of our uh, resource. And the reason being is the base of weathering, anything below that base of weathering horizon will contain kerogen oil. So that's something we don't want to contend with or have to worry about the processing as well for ESG or processing costs as well. So that really gives it a significant benefit as well. But through the beneficiation, simply all you've got to do is simply, uh, which we'll work through, is crush the ore, float away the calcium carbonate and the limestone, and then left with the concentrate of uh, vanadium in, in the shale. Um, from that, you just use acid leach. So the more calcium carbonate and organics you can float away, the, high, the better costs are for less acid absorption. Still frozen again. Point it, yeah? All right. There we are. So the vanadium has a few uses. Typically, it's used in the steel industry. So you use about a kilo of vanadium, of vanadium into a ton of steel or double the strength of steel. You continue to do that and you'll double it again. It's mainly used in alloys or rebar, and et cetera, and that's a majority of the market. But we're forecasting the biggest play the growth market being uh, in vanadium flow batteries. Um, so that's where we're, we're trying to develop our uh, ore and concentrate into a vanadium grade concentrate for electrolytes. And we've got support, I believe, from industry, government, Queensland government, um, federal government from who's funding the pilot plant, which we'll touch on in a moment as well, and, state, and the state government, what they're funding. But it really has a, a big advantage over any other large scale batteries, as in it's, it's non flammable, doesn't catch on fire, you can charge and discharge at the same time. It can hold longer than, uh, than uh, lithium ion, but it's mainly used from minimum from residential scale all the way up to grid scale um, storage solutions. So uh, I suppose as well, we talk about batteries in the largest, one of the larger uh, lithium ion batteries uh, in South Australia. And that's caught on fire, I think, two or three times now. But that's not the largest battery in this space that exists. It's at the moment there's a vanadium flow battery in China, in Dalian, which is 400 megawatts, 800 megawatt hours. So 200 megawatt, 800 megawatt hours, which holds about 9,000 tons of vanadium. And that put that in perspective. If we're running a two million ton per annum mine, run a mine, we're probably that's probably a year and a half worth of production just for that one battery system. So the forecast, the growth, the demand just for vanadium flow batteries is going to be is quite large already. There's forecast demand on it already based on projects that are um, locked in up to 2031. And based on the growth rate, that's 41% year on year 
up to 2031 for the growth of vanadium batteries. So I touched on some of the support we have across from state and federal. So at the moment, we're halfway through the uh, build of a pilot plant, which is getting built in Brisbane at Brisbane Met Labs, and that's funded by the federal government under a grant, and there's links to all the actual media statements here. Uh, so we'll be running our material through there next year, and I'll touch on that in a moment. Uh, very thankful that uh, the Queensland government's funded a minimum of uh, $10 million to build a vanadium demonstration plant as well in Port of Townsville, which is at the end of our road and rail line. And what that's, I think, going to do is accelerate the, the industry, the market. It's going to allow us to de-risk the whole project a lot quicker, a lot, lot cheaper. Um, it's going to allow us to lock in binding off takes as well um, with the bulk products we produce. So when we look at a bankable feasibility study, we can accelerate through that a lot quicker. And thanks to the Queensland Government there for their support. We've also got the National Battery Testing Centre, which we're partners of. Queensland Government, again, has funded $15 million there. And the, our component to that, we'll be looking to standardise and test vanadium for electrolytes in vanadium batteries, and we'll contribute there. And hopefully we can tie it in with battery manufacturing as well. So the progress so far, that good looking guy in the blue, that's me. Uh, we've got uh, the team from Inamitsu there, the managing director, deputy director, and one there, chief, um, chief engineer out there. Um, so what we've done in, in a short period of time, we had the flagship granted at the end of last year. We chalked it up really quickly based on historical drilling. Lodged a prospectus in May. Fortunate enough to secure Dimitsu as our strategic investor. I listed in September, end of September. Commenced drilling within the week. The new tenements around the flagship were granted. We've had two other tenements granted in, in copper and gold at Cloncurry as well, which I'll touch on. Uh, and we've completed our drilling. So I promise you, Core, I've got more. That's core that's below the base of weathering. So you can see the interbedded limestone shale unit there. And in the bottom there, you're seeing uh, fossils of shells or bivalves. Um, and it's that unit, the 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 light that the, the um, vein is bound with, with the aluminum silicates within the clay. So that's why we'll also be looking for aluminium as a, as a product as well. So here's a quarry or outcrop that's been quarried a little bit within our tenement and some core within the oxidizer zone, which majority of the deposit is. So if you look at the top core box, I was out there, I did the field work, so I'm not just sitting behind a desk. Um, we had, so yeah, the laser, um, that unit there correlates with that unit there. And then the next unit of uh, limestone in a bit of a shale, but more shale dominant correlates with this unit here. And this is the oxidized shale unit itself. All of that contains vanadium. It's simply about beneficiating and, and getting rid of the calcium carbonate and then the organics in there, then acid leach and strip that out. And, uh, and just has a, whoops, has a mudstone floor as well. So the other projects we've got as well around Cloncurry, uh, Fee Tree Creek and Lorena Surrounds. I'll just touch on these quickly. Uh, Fee Tree Creek, there's a historical mining lease there which has a similar geophysical electromagnetic signature as the Great Australian Mine here. Um, what's interesting about this project and why we pegged it, um, it's got a plethora of surface samples, rock chip samples, stream sediments, et cetera, that show copper and gold anomalies, but it's never had a drill hole, on, drill hole put on it. That was never exploited. So it's heavily underexplored, which is unique for the area. So we'll look to do some, uh, pull that data together. We'll do some site uh, mapping, but uh, mobile ion uh, sampling as well to look to define some drill targets from there. We'll have a similar rationale for Lorana Surrounds as well. There were three holes all pretty much in, right next to each other drilled there that showed uh, copper copper and gold mineralisation at sub-economical grades. Uh, other than that, there's been no other uh, exploration done on the area as well. There are some outcropping here and a few other places. Uh, so we'll look to define uh, that data as well by doing an MMI program and, and defining drill targets as well. So where to next? Um, well, we've already completed the drilling program, so the core's being slabbed at the moment and sent off to uh, for assays and the other remaining sent off to the uh, metallurgical work in Brisbane. Uh, on the completion, and then we'll 
with the, obviously with the assays come back, we'll have a, a chalk resource upgrade to tell everyone in the market. But uh, the, yeah, the metallurgical work, once, once that's completed and we've got a good handle on that, we'll go into the pilot plant test work in Brisbane. Uh, but in between that, it's, during Q1, we'll also commence scoping study and we'll do the exploration on the Cloncurry Gold uh, projects as well. So I suppose we're probably an example of uh, a critical minerals company being supported by industry and government and by that, by that token, we've been able to secure investment. Um, we want to be able to take our projects, particularly the flagship, into production and produce battery metals for Queensland. So um, hopefully we could be one of those uh, success stories for Queensland government and keep having the support. That's all I've got. Uh, any questions, send me after because time. Yeah, that's all well said. Thank all you. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Uh, Tom Evans, our second last presenter this afternoon, is up now. Senior geologist from Demetallica, uh, using groundwater isotopes to target buried VHMS deposits in the Charters Towers district. Welcome, Tom. Uh, thanks very much, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll be uh, talking about using groundwater isotopes, specifically copper isotopes, uh, to target buried VMH deposits, VHMS deposits in the Charters Towers region. Um, this uh, this study that we've uh, completed uh, just last year, or no, just the year, been uh, it was done. It was funded by um, the round five of the CEI, the uh, Collaborative Exploration Initiative Program, so funded through the GSQ, and the bulk of the analytical work and report writing, QAQC, and all the all the hard work really was done by the guys at the Isotropics Lab at, at James Cook University. That's um, uh, Brandon Mann, his team with Ryan Mather, Alex McCoy West, Hilary Lewis, and Johan Sanislav. Um, the results from this study, they'll become open file uh, on the 15th, which is, I think, Thursday next week. So getting a, a quick preview here in this uh, this session. So just if anyone needs to uh, duck out early, get some beers, I'll just run through the entire uh, program uh, in this slide here. So. We, uh, we 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 took 18 samples and uh, within the, the the Charters Towers area that were more specifically the Mount Windsor sub province just south of Charters Towers it's a VMS belt covering basically 50 by 30 kilometer uh, group of rocks and within that area that we sampled there was four there, there are four known pretty high grade VHMS deposits in uh, Thalanga, Lion Town, Waterloo and Highway Reward well, Highway Reward is it VHMS is it not doesn't matter. Um, it's high grade. Uh, and so the results we got from this is that we've confirmed, I think, very conclusively that the um, this method is a really good way of uh, telling whether or not you're close to a source of buried sulphide, uh, sulphide specifically that's interacting with the water table. And, um, and it's also given us some useful tools for vectoring at distance towards these deposits as well. And we'll go into that further, obviously. And also from an explorationist perspective, we found some outliers from the, the uh, from from the results that suggest that maybe we have some sources of buried sulfides that we didn't previously know about. Specifically, one south of the Thalanga mine and one west of the Lion Town deposit. So I'm going to uh, go through groundwater isotope systematics. Uh, I've simplified it down to a point where I feel that I can understand it. So. Uh, apologies to Brandon and um, and the team there if I've uh, if I've misrepresented anything. Um, then I'll have a quick look at some a successful study that was done by the GSQ and um, and JCU in Northwest Queensland a couple of years ago. Then have a look at the geological context for the Mount Windsor Mount Windsor sub province and why we think using this technique there is a is a pretty good idea. Uh, and then looking at methods, results, conclusions, and for future plans. So, groundwater metal isotope systematics. Effectively, there's a setup we've got here. Uh, basement, oops, sorry. Basement cover sequence uh, with a base metal sulphide or body deposit. Um, outcropping or not outcropping but subcropping on that basement cover contact you've got a surface of this uh, sulfide 
accumulation interacting with the water table. Now, what happens when you oxidatively weather the sulfides and the, is the, the metallic cations in that, they be typically, and specifically, I'll just clarify, I'm just talking about copper here. We've, we've measured a bunch of others, uh, but for the sake of simplicity and time, we'll just talk about copper. So the copper, copper cations, they get fractionated during that oxidative weathering process, and you'll end up with an enrichment of heavy copper isotopes, uh, Cu65, uh, in the groundwater as it's leaving the, leaving that deposit, uh, leaving or as, as the groundwater is moving away from from that interface. So, as the uh, as the groundwater flows through the aquifer, you then uh, those cations will preferentially be adsorbed onto clays within the aquifer. So you've got another process, another fractionation process going on after that weathering, which is actually driving the isotopic signature back down to lighter levels. You're removing heavy copper isotopes from the groundwater. So the net result of this is that you ought to get a really nice bullseye around these blind sulfide deposits in, in this environment. Now, there's obviously other factors that complicate this, but uh, I just want to keep it simple because it tells a nice story at the moment. So success in the Cloncurry district. Uh, in 2019, James McCuney and the GSQ uh, did quite a large study uh, south of Cloncurry near the Eloise uh, mine and around Eloise, Jericho, Altea and Moronan. So they're all quite, uh, they're, they're all uh, buried, uh, all undercover. They're all, um, uh, they're all sulphide dominant and quite high grade in their own right, locally, varying sizes. And as you can see from that result there, there's, uh, all the, the large red dots are the um, the strongly positively anomalous heavy isotope samples. They're all within like eight k's of a known deposit source. Sure, there's there's uh, low samples around there as well, and that's an interesting feature. But outside of that radius of where we're looking at the, at um, uh, looking at looking at these samples, there's not there's no high samples uh, a long way from any of these deposits in this area. So, um, so uh, in round five of the uh, of, of the CEO, we proposed doing a similar a similar study in the Charters Towers district on the Windsor project that we that we have there, uh, because we thought you know we've got a lot of cover in that area, we've got um, base metal sulfides around there, and that's what we're chasing. So, why the Charters Towers VMS bell? Well, it's it, the Mount Windsor sub province. It's a pretty significant. Um, VHMS uh, province in Australian terms. You know, you've got over a million tonnes of contained zinc in, in, in all the metal across there, and you've got pretty significant uh, copper, lead and silver as well. Now, all the mineralisation within this uh, this area is, is hosted within the Trooper Creek formation, as unit outlined in green. And most of the known deposits, with the exception of the Waterloo deposit, they're all occurring Really, in they're either outcropping or they're shallow subcrop, or just on the on the margins. So, you know, everything that's been discovered there, apart from Waterloo, has has been found by uh, field geology to a degree. So, the other the other important thing here, so that that means we've got lots of potential undercover. I would say the other important thing here is that all of these deposits have got really really valuable ore. You know, if you look at some of the uh, the grades we're seeing in this, you've got Falanga pre-mining, you're looking 12% zinc, 2.5% copper. Uh, high ray reward, 6% copper. I mean, this this stuff, it, it's really valuable dirt in these deposits. Um, and so, once again, that sort of thing, that gives you potential to, pretend, if you do find something, to be able to mine it underground as well, if, uh, if you're looking at significant depths of cover. So, we did a geological reinterpretation on there based on what the survey had already done because uh, there's quite a lot of uh, you know detailed mag and some EM and what have you over this area and um, the upshot of that was that uh, we found we within within our ground there was potential for uh, repeats of this prospective Trooper Creek formation there's potential for repeats of these structures that uh, look like they control the location of some of these main deposits. So we thought, yeah, there's this geological prospectivity through here under cover as well, uh, but it's still a very broad area. We've got lots and lots of targets. 
this isotope technique could potentially help us narrow down our area selection a little bit. So initially we identified 50 bores across this area, and this was one of the other reasons that, uh, that we came to this area. We look at the registered bore map um, on uh, that's available, and yeah, there was a heap of bores there. We get out in the field, uh, most of them either don't exist or don't work. Uh, and, and so at the end of the day, we, we, we could only get up to 18 of these bores. Um, so, and this is, this is one of the risks that you have with deploying this technique. It's obviously, it's only gonna work in certain areas where you do have enough bores and access to those bores. We also managed to get access to some of the dewatering bores up at Thalanga, these, uh, these five here. Um, uh, thanks to the guys at Red River Resources, they let us let us on to the lease to, to sample them, um, but we weren't able to get to the uh, to the monitoring bores around Lion Town, unfortunately. Which uh, I would still like to get back there and and sample those at some stage. So, how do we go about it? Well, uh, it's you're just collecting bore water. We purge the bores for about five minutes just to make sure it's fresh recharge um, from the aquifer in the sample uh, that we're grabbing. Uh, we only need half a litre uh, and we would double up for QAQC purposes on, on some bores, take multiple samples, uh, you filter it and you stick it in the fridge or, you know, you angle on the back of your ute. And, and that's it. I mean, it's a bit more complicated than that, but it's a pretty simple process. Um, so at the site, at the, at the sample site, we'd also uh, use one of these uh, view situ Aquatrol 500 water quality probes and you can just poke a probe in that, it gives you a whole bunch of data, like on pH, temperature, salinity, um, redox potential, uh, total dissolved solids, all, all this sort of stuff. And it, that's just a quick measurement that you take. You collect quite a lot of data. We initially just did that for QAQC purposes. If we were, found something funky in the, in, in the isotope readings, when we got those back from the lab, we could go back to this data and say, oh, okay, maybe it's the result of X, Y, or Z um, in the water. But it turns out, that there's actually some useful parameters that you can measure in there that have their own sort of um, uh, prospectivity potential as well. So once you've got the samples, we take them back to the lab, uh, to the isotropics lab, they get split, split up, major element, trace element, isotopic analysis, and all the major and, and trace element analysis and the strontium analysis, they're all done at, uh, at the ASC, at James Cook Uni, um, whereas the uh, copper and zinc um, isotopic analyses, they were conducted in the States at, at Ryan Mather's lab uh, there. So what what did we get? What did we see? Well, firstly, uh, Brandon and the team defined an anomaly threshold of 0.4 per mil uh, deviation. So, point, so they, that, that's what they determined that effectively a 50-50 mix of um, an isotopic signature from a sulfide source versus a background level would be. Um, I'm not entirely sure how they came up with with that number, but it, it's well, I can't recall it off the top of my head. The, the methodology there, it's in the reports that'll become um, uh, that'll become public next week. Um, but that's our that's our anomaly threshold. So you can see we end up with some good strong anomalies close to Thalanga, some more near Highway Reward. Um, Everything seems to be working nicely, but we also end up with something that is just anomalous, just above that 0.4 uh, down at Ken's Bore, uh, well south of Thalanga, also quite proximal to some undercover interpreted uh, Mount Windsor, uh, Trooper Creek formation. And we end up with a sample here at Brumby Well uh, that is 0.39. So once again, borderline anomalous, but, uh, but interesting nonetheless. So what I did here to have a have a closer look at some of this data and well, look at look at the data from a different angle, um, I, uh, I classed the data based on which known deposit it was closest to um, and then measured the distance from that bore to that deposit. So I just threw some uh, Voronoi polygons around each of the um, each of each of the deposits there and uh, and classed them that way. So then if we plot up the copper Delta 65 results against uh, distance to their nearest deposit. You can see the different deposits uh, groups there, Highway, Lion Town, Thalanga, Waterloo. You can see that inside of that five kilometre um, radius there, so 
there's the five kilometer five kilometer radius there inside of that wherever we have these proximal samples we have a, a large dynamic range in the results of the data but every single highly anomalous one sits within that um, five kilometer radius so i think that that's a really interesting result in its own right and um, and vindicates this technique in the same way that the, the Cloncurry survey did as well Another really interesting thing I think that comes out of this is that outside of that five kilometre radius, we see some positive correlation here or negative correlation, but we still see uh, a linearity in the data uh, between distance to nearest deposit and um, copper, copper isotope ratios. So sure, there's not a lot of data points in, in there, for, certainly not for the Waterloo ones, um, but I think that, you know, there, there is a compelling trend there, I think, that potentially we've got a tool that we can use to vector towards buried mineralisation uh, from outside of that five kilometre range. And I'll just point out as well, this sample here is the Ken's bore sample. So you can see it's well and truly not related to the, um, spatially related to the uh, to the rest of the Thalanga samples there. So it's a long way away from Thalanga. If, that isotopic signature is related to um, buried sulfides, then it's a new sulfide source somewhere near there, probably around five kilometres away. So a few other interesting things that we noted. Uh, oxidation reduction potential that we measured uh, with this bad boy here, uh, that shows quite an interesting correlation as well uh, with the distance to deposit. So. I mean, there's yeah, you, you, you'd say there's a trend there. I mean, there's a few outliers, obviously, but it's, it's it's an interesting result, I thought, and probably one of the most sort of, well, it was the most interesting one that came out of the data that we, we got with this tool. Um, it, it's really easy and cheap to measure in the field too, which so that, that's, that's very good from an explorations perspective. So the relationship that we see here with uh, oxidation reduction potential, low numbers being reduced, high numbers being oxidised, is what you'd expect in this situation as well. Groundwater uh, that you're sampling closer to a sulphide ore body would be more reduced. Groundwater that you're sampling further away is probably going to be more oxidised. Um, so that all makes sense and it's it's possibly a useful tool that you can deploy elsewhere. Obviously, it's dependent on if you've got um, reductants in your aquifers and, and that sort of thing. So, but uh, there's complexities, but also possibilities. Other interesting things we found were total amounts of copper, lead and zinc in the groundwater uh, actually correlate, probably correlate positively with distance from ore body. So this is counterintuitive uh, where you've got higher amounts of copper, lead and zinc in the groundwater the further you get away from the deposit. Um, so obviously looking, just doing the, these kind of measurements is, uh, is not a great way to start looking for ore bodies in groundwater, isotopes and reduction and redox potential, et cetera, is better. But I think the reason for this is probably tied up in what we were seeing in the previous slide. Oxidised groundwater is simply going to be capable of carrying more base metals than um, uh, than reduced groundwater, uh, and, and that's just a reflection of, of that. So what does it all mean? This is just reiterating on, on where I went uh, with the previous slide. High values and high dynamic ranges within five kilometres, but importantly, every strongly fractionated result comes from that zone. Um, we do see potential linear correlations beyond the five kilometre zone. Uh, and one of the things I'm looking at potentially is that this trend here for the th Liontown samples is actually related to a different sulphide source because it suggests that maybe we're a little closer than 10 kilometres uh, if we're pushing up into this anomalous area. Um, but I think we've demonstrated that this method is a very useful tool for area selection if you are in a, an area that has cover and has lots of water bores that you can sample. So do we have a new new uh, discovery at Ken's Bore? That's a 5K radius loop around Ken's Bore. It covers a lot of this interpreted Mount uh, Tripper Creek formation. Um, definitely needs more work on that. And do we see something around Brumby Well? Yes, we've actually got a line of prospects that we're working on along this margin here uh, of the, that's the upper contact of the Trooper Creek formation uh, that we're working on. So we, we'll continue to work on that. That's just help us focus and rank our targeting in, in for those particular areas. So Ken's bore target, I think one more interesting thing to note, and this is my last slide, is that in this zone here that we've interpreted as Trooper Creek formation, 
there's actually, if you squint at it right, there's a demagnetised zone um, in that area. And demagnetised zones are a pretty good, um, well, you, you do get uh, demagnetised zones in the alteration halos in the foot wall around VHMS deposits. So this is quite a positive thing and, and I'm, I'm quite excited about this target. Uh, and I'm looking forward to, to doing some more work on it next year. Brumby well target, once again, yes, we have we have a few prospects along there and we'll continue to work on those. I'm thinking gravity is probably a good way to go, certainly with, with these ones as electrical geophysics uh, isn't much chop in sphalerite ore bodies. Um, so uh, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks very much, Tom. Right. One to go, Svetlana Tesselina, uh, come to the stage. Uh, Associate Professor, Curtin University. Uh, Svetlana will be talking on 4D history of mineral deposits using lead isotopes from ore body to the continent, continent scale. Oh, what should I do? Let's forward. Uh, thank you everyone for staying until the last talk and I'll try to make it shorter. And thank you very much for organizers and for great talks today. I really enjoy it. Thank you for um, all the speakers uh, today. Um, in my talk, I'll try to convince you that we can use lead isotopes as a great fingerprinting tool for mineral deposits. Um, and I'd like to thank and acknowledge my co-authors from John DeLater Center, as well as Geoscience Australia, especially Dave Houston, who is here today. Um, uh, uh, Okay, um, I was impressed by uh, mineral potential of Queensland today, and especially traditional and critical minerals. And, and as you mentioned this morning, now we have to go undercover and dig deeper, and we have to understand better some of the mineral, mineralized processes, and as well as um, um, structural control of some of the deposits. Uh, as you probably know, zinc recently joined a list of critical minerals in US, uh, which is not surprising really because it is really important in our everyday life. Uh, and Queensland in this respect is really fortunate because it's hosting the large uh, zinc um, lead province in the world, including um, some of the biggest deposits such as Mount Isa. Uh, but unfortunately, despite um, uh, some exploration work going on for the last 20 years, it wasn't really any ma major discovery uh, except um, probably only one deposit. And in this respect, we probably need to work harder to understand better mineralization processes and structural control of those deposits. Um, yeah, we can ask uh, two uh, really important questions. How do we distinguish um, prospective uh, basins? Um, and uh, inside these prospective basins, can we distinguish more favorable zones uh, for this type of deposits? Uh, to answer this question, a uh, lot of work um, has been already done in the last 20 years, and especially um, in respect to geophysics. It was established that those deposits are related, um, associated with uh, anomalies, especially in gravity uh, anomaly. And also, it was established that zinc uh, lead deposits um, are associated with the ages of continental shells um, or platforms. Uh, this recent paper was published, I think, just this month in Mineralium Depositor uh, in open access uh, uh, by Dave Houston et al. So I invite you to have a look. It's a really great paper. It summarizes some findings uh, relative to geophysics. So I'm not going to repeat that. You saw uh, this slide this morning. Um, I'd like to focus on lead isotopes. Um, this is just a few basics about lead isotopes. I could probably meet some of them, but I'd like to attract your attention to one parameter, which is mu. Uh, so mu parameter refers to uranium lead ratio from which uh, this lead originated from. And uh, whole rocks and minerals with different uranium lead ratio will um, 
evaluate along different um, trends on this diagram. Um, it's um, actually also it's used in thermotectonic model to describe um, mixture between different uh, major reservoirs such as mantle, mantle and crust. So crust having uh, uh, high mu values and mantle low mu values and uh, forming this origin with a mixed isotope signature. Um, so, uh, on this slide on the left side, you can see lead isotope map produced by J. Um, and as you can see, all those deposits, uh, lead zinc deposits, they're all uh, grouped along this age, um, uh, age of, the, the, of this uh, continental uh, thick continental lithosphere, and they are also associated with a, a sharp gradient in mu values. Not sure this pointer doesn't work well. Um, in addition to that, uh, some of the published data from our Myra report uh, can illustrate some of those points. Uh, for example, if you are looking at Mount Isa deposit, which is one of the biggest deposits. Uh, lead, lead, zinc lead deposits in the world, we can see that it, it has very homogeneous lead isotopic data, um, despite its big size, and also that it was generated from uh, uh, relatively homogeneous uh, lead reservoir, uh, which sampled a large volume of continental crust, thick continental crust. So probably we need a relatively thick continental crust um, to produce such a big uh, deposit, deposits. When we are looking at eastern uh, belt, uh, we see um, smaller deposits, except maybe two, Cunnington and uh, another one. So, um, and uh, they are characterized by low mu values and plot on a separate growth curve, which was established for um, both of those belts. Uh, the, the slides you saw this morning, I'm not going to repeat it. So as you can see, this main point from this slide was that those deposits, lead zinc deposits, um, shell hosted deposits um, are associated with the boundaries between continental blocks um, and um, uh, located at cratonic ages. There are some more um, uh, features which can be used to search inside this favorable and prospective basins, uh, but I'm not going to uh, go through it. You can see on a slide. Um, just a few more points, um, interesting points about lead isotopes. So as you can see, sometimes, um, oh, sorry. Um, sometimes um, uh, some deposits uh, such as uh, Monakov and Casablanca, they show more radiogenic lead isotopic composition, which were attributed to the post soldiers Cup event, which could be ascribed to Isan orogeny. It was probably produced by multiple uh, pulses of hydrothermal fluid. Um, another important uh, thing I should uh, briefly mention is uh, uh, threshold and lead concentrations. We need to produce um, lead is the top data which are close to initial lead. Um, so um, it was proposed that 200 ppm of lead is uh, necessary to produce the lead isotope data uh, close to the initial data of mineralized system. So we, um, we can use uh, pyrite and other sulfides, not, not compulsory galena, but all other sulfides also usually work well, especially pyrite. Um, yeah, I'm not going to comment on left. It's a bit more complex story. Um, yeah, um, unfortunately, in the case of low lead copper gold mineralization, um, in most of the cases, so uh, we see this radiogenic trend, 
which is ascribed to uh, relatively high uranium contents uh, or uh, radiogenic in growth of lead due to uranium decay uh, because of the low lead contents and probably relatively elevated uranium contents. But anyway, um, they have limited use uh, in terms of lead isotopes. Um, however, we can still produce secondary isochrons and estimate the ages by, based on that. So it's not complete waste. Um, yeah, this are just examples of uh, maps produced by GA and published in um, in J records, uh, so I'll probably skip this as well. Um, just, um, yeah, maybe main points is that um, uh, some parameters which are plotted uh, from lead isotope ratio, such as, uh, oops, sorry, such as uh, mu, uh, uranium lead ratios, um, or delta, delta T refers to the difference between the mineralization age and the model age. Uh, some of those um, parameters, they uh, really uh, highlight uh, the tectonic structures, especially, uh, let me just show you, maybe like Macquarie Arc, they really stand, stand out uh, in terms of mu, uh, so it's more juvenile and also characterized by much higher delta T. Um, some of the data also exist in Queensland in this respect, but yeah, it would be nice to have more data if possible. Uh, and also, uh, I think it's really interesting conclusion that in this particular delta T uh, map, we can see a decrease in delta T, uh, which probably indicates the dominant influence of Australian crust to the west in, in influence on Pacific crust to the east. So such a conclusions which can be valuable from just the plotting uh, parameters uh, from isotopic composition of lead on a bigger scale, regional scale. Um, and at the moment, I, um, just another a few words. I'm sorry about uh, taking you uh, your attention uh, for a bit longer. It's a comparison between um, neodymium uh, map produced uh, use, using neodymium isotopes. Um, Particularly, this one refers to neodymium model ages in comparison to the map produced used lead isotopes. As you can see, it's uh, from Western Australia. I'm sorry I didn't have such an example for Queensland. But as you can see, we have very similar patterns, uh, despite the fact that they've been produced using completely different um, rocks. Uh, so on the, in, in case of neodymium, it's based on granites. In case of lead, it's based on sulfides. But you, as you can see, most juvenile crust uh, for neodymium with youngest um, uh, neodymium model ages correspond to the most juvenile or lowest mu values, which is uh, uh, really interesting. And at the moment with uh, Geoscience Australia, so we are working on the second edition of uh, a lead isotope map. Uh, I, hope, uh, prob I hope we will um, finish it next year. And um, yeah, I really hope we can collaborate on lead <laughs> isotopes and some maybe other isotopes. And I convinced you that they are still quite useful in fingerprinting uh, of uh, mineral deposits. Uh, for example, we can definitely just, um, uh, fingerprint uh, some particular mineralized event based on lead isotope ratio, and we can def we can probably say which one is uh, economic deposit and which one is just um, a small um, uh, prospect. Um, oh, sorry, something happened. Um, yep. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, thank you for uh, pushing through that talk, Svetlana, as well. I know we're, uh, we're pushed. No, no, nothing to apologize for. Um, 
Thank you very much for hanging around uh, to the end uh, today. It's wonderful to see so many faces um, after 5.30. So sincerely, thank you for, for sticking with us. Um, on behalf of Helen Dejling and the entire GSQ team, thank you for taking part in Digging Deeper. That's to everyone in the room, plus everyone online. Um, and thank you for your patience uh, while we work through some IT issues today, but we got there in the end. Uh, all the talks have been recorded and links will be shared. So look out for those. We'll send around a quick email seeking your feedback. We do listen, as Helen said earlier, we do uh, value the thoughts and feedback from industry, from academia. So please tell us what you think that helps shape our future body of work. So uh, yeah, please let us know your thoughts. Thank you to all presenters as well uh, for making the time to prepare your talks uh, and, and be here in person and to all the uh, fantastic contributors for the posters outside. To have so many high quality posters uh, is a, uh, a really good reflection of the future uh, of this industry. So thank you to all the, the poster contributors. Thank you to Matt and Roger and the GSQ team for helping put on today. Michael on the desk. I think I've covered off everyone. I'm sorry if I have missed you.